The market has been on a super high over the last few days. We've seen volatility across all asset markets. We might see some downturn dynamics driven by monetary policy. We're going to look at a higher for longer story, not necessarily a scenario where central banks are entertaining cuts next year. The Fed's really going to struggle to convince markets that it needs to do a total 125 basis points in those last two meetings of the year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. It is Payrolls Friday, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Ravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow, with futures unchanged on the S&P. Bramo, the number, a few hours away. And people are expecting it to be in the mid 200 thousands. How much does it actually move the needle? What actually has to happen for people to change the narrative around a Federal Reserve that seems dead set on raising rates regardless of what happens? Did you see the Governor Waller push back oh my yesterday goodness. afternoon? Literally, they're saying every possible scenario for you to be bullish Throw nope. it out. Nope. 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 <laughs> I mean, nope. Really, that's the entirety of it. We're going to hear from Williams a little bit later as well. Lisa will go through the Fed speak in just a moment. The data, bad news, good news. Are we going to push back against that today? That's basically what the Fed uh, officials are saying. They're saying that, honestly, there's no scenario that they can foresee that's going to cause them to reverse course in the near term. That's basically what each and every one of them, even the former doves, are coming out and saying. And they're saying it again and again, and it's consistent. Is this market getting the message or is this market pricing that in? Clearly, this is what the Fed wants to signal. I take issue with the bad news is good news story. Oh, I think you if, you can have, <laughs> if you can have a positive supply side story, then that is overwhelmingly good news. If you have a story that is just demand getting hammered by a Federal Reserve hike in rates and you don't get a supply side response, for me, bad news is bad news. But is that a labor market story? And this is a question that we've been sure. asking this week, which is people are pointing to the labor market as the trigger point for the Federal Reserve to change, to change course, to possibly not raise rates as quickly. But is that the correct one or is that a lagging indicator at a time when perhaps it is these less controllable factors like supply chains coming back online that could reduce some of the inflationary pressure? And just for the record, I'm not here to argue with how the market is trading all of this, because obviously if we do get a bad number today, we've seen how that's traded all week. <laughs> The ISM, the orders component of the ISM, jobless claims, take your pick all through the week. It's been example after example of a market training on bad news as if it's good news. OK, I'm not going to let you get away with this. You sure, come out and you're, like, you're saying you're basically, I, I'm going to reject this bad news is good news. Good news can be good news. And then you're saying, I'm saying but me, I'm not okay. going to fight back because that's how the market's going to okay, trade. So I understand that. And that's going to be the case. Give me a couple case. of seconds. Carry on. Tactically, I can understand <laughs> how bad news brings the ultimate peak in the terminal rate down. If that happens, I can see why the equity market in the short term trades positively. Risk on. Got all of that. I just mean in the long term, if you have bad news after bad news, bad print after bad print, and you see a recession, and this Fed follows through in the way they're telling us, which essentially is no rate cuts in a recession, then I think that's problematic. That's questionable. I think that's more questionable than just saying, yeah, bad news is good news. They're going to back away. Bye, bye, bye. There's a nuance here that I think is really important that you're getting at which is we're all tracking the labor market, but maybe it's the wrong indicator. And maybe we're going to see a shift in the Federal Reserve as they look to some of these year-over-year -year comparison numbers and how quickly the deceleration of inflation is. And maybe next week when we get CPI, that will be a key figure that might provide more insights than even the labor market. Now, once we get CPI, you can forget all the other data points. <laughs> exactly, that's it, my that's, point. That's going to hijack the whole story exactly. next week. Futures right now. Unchanged on the S&P 500. TK would be going nuts right now, wouldn't he? He'd be like, bad oh, news, my God, news, our news, star, star, I can't enough. even take it. We just enough. It. Okay. Equities unchanged <laughs> in the equity market. We're going nowhere on the S&P 500. Up on the week by more than 4%. So a decent week so far. Yields look a little something like this, higher by a single basis point on a 10-year, 383.67. Euro dollar just a little bit firmer. The kind of price action you'd associate with a payrolls Friday morning, Lisa, we're going nowhere. Yeah, which basically people don't know bad news, good news, good news, bad news. They reject the premise, but they accept the market reaction. Anyway, 8.30 a.m., we get a sense of what the actual number is. September U.S. non-farm payrolls comes out. The high is from J.P. Morgan Asset Management's David Kelly, 389,000. The low, 199,000 from South Bay Research. Will it make a difference if it comes in on the low end? Will that actually be a tradable issue past today, past the first few hours? I don't know the answer to that. Did you see what Danny Berger said? Really tight range. I eyeballed the same thing. 190,000. Tightest range on high to low on the payrolls report in the guesses that we've seen since the pandemic started. What do you make of that? Um, are people getting more conviction or they realize that they don't know, so they might as well go for a round number? To the sort the of guesses not... used to be so wild from 100K all the way out to about 750. 
It used to be nuts. Yeah, so now I guess people see more stability or perhaps they just don't want to be stand out as they get it wrong. Also today, we're getting the U.S. administration to uh, the response to the labor market report. I hear there's a press conference with Marty Walsh uh, on your property on Bloomberg Television at 9.40 a.m. How come I'm excited on. for that. I think it'll be interesting to see how he dovetails a, a good report being somehow bad and how he addresses this. Also, President Biden will be uh, discussing that. And today on The Daily Fed Show, we have, drumroll please, New York Fed President John Williams, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic. And John, to your point earlier, we have just talked consistently about how they have all been on the same page. They all keep talking about how they want to hike rates. They want to keep them at about four and a half percent or even higher. And they're not going to budge, even in the face of pretty extreme weakness. Do you know my tweet of the morning? Tweet of the last 24 hours. We'll catch up with Bloomberg's AMH down in D.C. in about 10 minutes' time. This came from Deva Hazarika, and I hope that I've pronounced that right, out on Twitter. When the history books are written, will OPEC get the credit it deserves for legalising marijuana in America? <laughs> Don't you like that line? <laughs> Operation Midterms. That's fantastic. Operation so just, Midterms. Okay, so in case somebody doesn't understand, uh, this comes as President Biden yesterday said that nobody should be in jail for possessing or uh, using marijuana and basically... Abolishing that and sure. basically somehow they got a free pass. Wow, that's awesome. Do you like that? I, I do I like that. that was pretty cool. That's, that's very clever. Okay, joining us now is David Balin. We'll save that for maybe in 10 minutes' time. Without David, CIO and Global Head of Investments at City Global Wealth. David, let me just start with the payrolls number a little bit later this morning and what you and the team are looking for. Well, we think it's going to be, you know, in the uh, high 200,000s. We're looking at around 275,000 as an expectation. But I love what you both were talking about because the fact is it really almost doesn't matter. You know, monthly data, when we look back on it, of course, is revised all of the time. And, uh, and so you know, what we actually see today is, is in, many, in many cases sort of a, a head fake in terms of what, what's actually happening. David, I was going through your notes and it just screamed, be patient, wait. What are the preconditions before you add equity risk? What are you waiting for? Well, you know, when we take a look at the history of, of the Fed and its ability to keep rates high, we typically see that, you know, after a couple of months of actual unemployment, the Fed will bring rates down. So that, that's sort of the pivot point that's out in the future. But what we're actually, when it comes to thinking about what they're doing, right, they're raising rates extremely quickly in order to fight inflation, which is by definition a slow uh, number to actually come down, you know, because it's looked at over 12 months and it's looked at backwards. And so I think what we're looking on to take equity risk is a situation where we have the ability to see, right, what ultimately what earnings will be next year, right? And there's a huge variation as to what people expect earnings uh, to come through at. And, and once we have a line of sight on earnings, and I think we have a line of sight on the fact that the Fed is or is or at near rates, we are going to be adding equity risk in a whole variety of places. And frankly, you know, at that point, you'll have the ability to see the dollar peaking and, and lots of things that suggest we have much more risk in our portfolios. But right now, you know, you've been talking about it. The uh, the fact is that the Fed is uh, on a one-way freight train and they're moving very quickly. So David, it sounds like you're on hold. And I'm wondering how many of your colleagues are also kind of on hold and just sort of sitting sitting on the sidelines and watching this drama of good news and bad news and people kind of winding themselves up into a tizzy uh, from a distance. Well, you know, we're never on hold because clients are always invested in the market and we don't want clients to market time. Uh, this past week, just as an example, we saw a 6% up day uh, in Hong Kong. And those big days matter so much to portfolios, to an equity investors, that they have to have equities in their portfolio, right, in order to you know, make those profits over time. Uh, and so we don't want people to market time. What we've done is make our portfolios exceedingly defensive in terms of what we actually have them exposed to. So we're obviously dominantly in the United States. We're dominantly uh, with you know, shares that are dividend oriented, with places with extremely reliable earnings, regardless of what happens in the economy and things like that. And while it doesn't prevent the downside at all that we've seen, it does actually provide a cushion to it and allows you to be in the market as it turns. How defensive are long duration U.S. government bonds? Um, they're pretty defensive, right? And, and, you know, I look back just, you know, eight months ago, right? And I think to myself, you know, those bonds were worthless in a portfolio when they had extremely low yield. But if you were to take a look at, a, you know, even a 10-year bond and you take a look at the inflation expectations that are baked into TIPS, you know, the long-term inflation expectations in the bond market today are 2.4, 2.5%. So, you know, you can actually get positive carry, right, on those bonds if you've got a, if you've got a 10-year view. And so uh, right now we're not recommending that our clients actually extend duration uh, because they're being paid so handsomely, you know, in the earlier, in the you know, uh, shorter part of the curve. 
But I think that actually is another good play that's coming ahead of us. You know, the Fed is only able to keep their rates um, in place, right, for a period of seven months near peak on average, going back over the last 40 years. So, you know, every all of the forward expectations on the curve suggest higher for longer, they're going to be able to keep it that way for, you know, for m- much of next year. And the, and the fact of the matter is that there's not a lot of history to suggest that. Once we have real data that indicates we are heading into a recession, and that probability has risen mightily over the last three months, I think the Fed will actually relent. David Palin of City Global Wealth. David, you are not the only one who believes that. Thank you, sir. Lisa, you've been saying this all week, haven't you? The difference between what the Fed speakers want to signal and what market participants think they'll actually do. Oh, my God. I absolutely love this discussion. I'm looking right now at the Fed funds projections, and there still is rate cuts priced in. For next year, even though Fed officials basically, not basically, they are coming out and they're saying we're not going to cut rates next year. Repeatedly. And um, Governor Waller, and yesterday, I think you're right to point this out, he basically said everyone worried about financial stability concerns. No. I'm not. Not at all. It's not going to be a problem for us. Monetary policy should be focused on bringing down inflation. Period. Full stop. Do you think the Bank of England muddied the waters or actually do you think the Bank of England almost highlighted that by saying this was a financial stability decision? We'll do this with bond buying. The Monetary Policy Committee has to make a separate decision about bringing down inflation. The Bank of England arguably is a predecessor to what other banks are going to do. And this is what David Balin is talking about, that when it actually comes to the moment, they're going to have a hard time not responding to a financial stability issue that brings everything to a halt or causes a run on funds. And I think that's the reason why people still are baking in rate cuts, are still baking in a much more dovish Fed than the rhetoric might otherwise imply. Where does it leave QT? Well, I actually looked yesterday, yeah, 4.30 and? p.m. It was the biggest monthly decline in, or weekly decline, I should say, in the balance sheet there going go. back to September of 2021. It's finally happening. Coming up on this program, the president holding a fundraiser in New York City just yesterday. We're trying to figure out what is Putin's off-ramp. Where does he get off? Where does he find a way out? Some strong language from the president. We'll pick up on that with Anne-Marie down in D.C. in just a moment. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden is worried that Vladimir Putin's threats to use tactical nuclear weapons are real and could lead to, quote, Armageddon. At a fundraiser in New York, the president said the U.S. is trying to figure out the Russian leader's off-ramp. Putin renewed his nuclear threats when he announced the annexation of territory in Ukraine. The Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded to human rights activists from Ukraine, Russia and Belarus. They were cited for documenting war crimes, human rights abuses and abuse of power. At the same time, the chair of the Nobel Committee criticized Vladimir Putin and the government in Belarus for suppressing activists. Investors and the Fed will be watching today's monthly U.S. jobs report very closely. It's forecast to show that employers added 255,000 jobs in September, and that would be the smallest number, smallest number since a decline in late 2020. Still, it would be an indication that the labor market is strong. The report comes out at 8.30 New York time. It's a show of financial strength for Credit Suisse. After days of concern about the bank's solidity, the Swiss lender announced a cash debt buyback worth about $3 billion. Credit Suisse remains locked in turmoil just weeks away from the announcement of a major strategic review. The bank's shares have lost more than half their value this year. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. U.S. companies to ensure that they continue to increase production uh, and make sure that we have the refining capacity. Uh, we're down a couple refineries due to uh, some accidents and maintenance uh, to make sure that we have enough inventory uh, along the uh, East Coast and parts of the Midwest and the West Coast to make sure that we have supplies. And we're going to continue to focus on bringing down prices. Fantastic conversation yesterday with Amos Hochstein, the senior advisor for energy security at the U.S. State Department, led by Amory Horton and Alex Steele. From New York City this morning, good morning with Lisa Bramitz and Jonathan Farrow. Futures look like this on the S&P. We're down about a tenth of one percent. Going into payrolls, looking for something like 200 and. 
55,000. Lisa, this conversation about the Fed not wanting to make people unhappy, can we just revisit the speech? I went back to the speech from Jackson Hole again last night to reread what Powell had to say. And this word pain, while higher interest rates, slower growth and softer labour market conditions will bring down inflation, they will also bring some pain to households and businesses. I would argue the goal is to make people upset, just not as upset as they would be if inflation continued, because he concluded those remarks by saying these are the unfortunate costs of reducing inflation, but a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. And Mary Daly, who is on the more dovish or used to be on the more dovish camp, came out just as aggressively and really reiterated this, that every conversation she had was about inflation and what's that doing to your paycheck, not necessarily how tough it is to get a job, because right now it's not. We'll get the White House response to this a little bit later. We need to pick up on the comments from the president of the United States in the last 12 hours or so. The president of the United States warning of nuclear Armageddon. Let's get to the team coverage right now with Bloomberg's Marie Tadeo in Prague and Marie down in D.C. AMH, walk me through those comments from the president of the United States. <clears throat> Clearly, this is on his mind, Jonathan. He's really upping the ante. What we heard from administration officials like Jake Sullivan saying this has always been something that Putin has brandished, this nuclear threat. But now with the president coming out and talking about, one, that they're trying to find an off-ramp because they want to make sure he does not use tactical nuclear weapons. Then the president says, where does he find a position, himself in a position that he does not not only lose face, but lose significant power in Russia. He is not joking. This is the president of the United States saying when he talks about potential use of tactical nuclear weapons or biological and chemical weapons, because his military is, you might say, significantly underperforming. And then he talks about how this would end up in Armageddon. And I just want to pick up quickly on that point about his military significantly underperforming. What is going out right now in Russia and what you could see across Russian state TV is more pushback and criticism of the military. Nothing happens on Russia Russian state TV without the blessing of the Kremlin, which means they are allowing this criticism of the military. And a question is, is this leaving the door open for the public opinion to say, well, in order to win this, Putin needs to do something bigger? Maria, how have the Europeans responded to this? Well, to me, in this uh, meeting, uh, what you see is this very clear West and East divide at times. For Western leaders, uh, we did not get any reaction from the French president. Remember, Emmanuel Macron always says that when you talk nuclear, this is not something that you can casually uh, mention. In fact, at times when he gets asked, he doesn't even use the word uh, nuclear. No comment either from the Germans. But the Eastern Europeans, they have a different take uh, on this. When you speak to the Lithuanians, Estonia, these are right next to Russia, Baltic countries. They say, let's not take the bait. We know that Vladimir Putin, whenever he feels he's in trouble, whenever he's pushed back in the corner, he will always bring up the nuclear uh, threats. You should not take the bait because that will only encourage him uh, to get uh, more, more powerful, more forceful in that extent. And then when it comes to how can you offer him a way out? Well, the Finnish uh, prime minister, Sanna Marin, she said the only way out of this is for Russia to leave Ukraine. They've got to go. Well, and Anne Marie, this really raises a question about why there seems to be a dissonance between Jake Sullivan and President Biden, because Jake Sullivan has really shrugged off some of this as threats, like Eastern European nations. They're raising the concern, but Western uh, European nations, not so much. Why President Biden had such fiery rhetoric last night? That's a question we just do not know. One, is it potentially that the president is seeing more intel more recently? Um, is it the fact that the president is being a bit more forthright with the press? Remember, in the past, the president is the one who has said things that the White House continuously walks back. I remember that press conference when it was a Bloomberg reporter who talked, what asked, what would the repercussions be if Russia invaded? And remember what the president's answer was. He depends how much was. How much are we talking about Russia going in? And the White House had to come back and say a single tank over that line, there would be a swift, severe response. The president often says things out loud that other officials are a little bit more uh, conservative when it comes to that. The second, of course, is that, listen, I'm not, I'm going to say all domestics are politics. I don't think individuals should use foreign policy as a domestic policy. But if this is something the president could be using to make sure that he is telling these at these fundraisers, we need to make sure that we are keeping the right individuals in the right places to make sure we have this Western front against Russia. And there could be no qualms about the aid we're sending, et cetera. And we should stay the status quo in terms of Democrats in power because of foreign policy concerns. You see this all over the world, right? When there's domestic issues, 
a lot yeah. of times you see leaders point to foreign affairs. Just quickly here, Maria, in Prague, as all of the EU energy ministers meet, how much is there a discussion about never relying on Russia again for natural gas, or how much is that sort of looming out there still as this existential question? Oh, no, uh, this is out of the question. Everyone that I talk to will say this is done. Russia has a great uh, energy supplier to the European Union, has a great uh, energy power to the, well, to Europe and in general. This is over. It's done. You can't go back uh, to normal relations for as long as Vladimir Putin is the president of the Russian Federation. By the way, when you look at imports, there were 40 percent of all gas imports were coming from Russia. Now it's about 7 percent. I think overall what they want to see, however, are prices going down. And they're looking at countries like Norway, like Algeria, hoping uh, to renegotiate some of the contracts so that the prices uh, come down. There is no consensus for the time being, but listen, there is now a timeline. I did speak with uh, the Greek Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, and he said in two weeks' time, so at the end of October, we need to have something on paper and make a decision with regards to the price cap and how we implement it. Maria, thank you. Maria, today there on the latest from Prague, AMH down in D.C. I'm Marie, thank you. Tough week for the White House on the international stage. That's for sure. I'm thinking more so of OPEC Plus earlier this week. And how humiliating that was and sure. how much of a lack of response they really have to it, <clears throat> other than just saying they haven't used up the entire strategic petroleum reserve. They have more to go. I think they've used about 155,000 or 155 million barrels versus the 180 million barrels that they said that they would sell. And so they can sell more heading into the midterm elections. But aside from that, it's a huge snub, especially after that fist bump. We caught up with Francisco Blanche of Bank of America yesterday. I saw that. About the unintended negative consequences associated with politicizing the SPR. Basically said we haven't had the oil crisis yet. He's not saying we're going to get one, but he says we haven't had it yet. And if we have one and the SPR's exhausted, we've got an even bigger problem. From New York City this morning, good morning. Payroll's just around the corner. Sarah House of Wells Fargo coming right up. Live from New York City, good morning to you on this Payrolls Friday. The median estimate in the Bloomberg survey, 255,000. The price action going into that number two hours away looks a little something like this on the S&P. S&P 500 futures negative about a tenth of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down about a half of 1%. We have had a very, very whippy week, but we're still up on the week by about 4.5% on the S&P 500. Energy names up every single day, Monday through Thursday. Those names as a group on the S&P up almost 15% in just four days. And you can thank the commodity market for that, of course. WTI and Brent look a little something like this this morning. Brent crude at 95.39, up more than 1% on WTI, 89.38, up more than 1% also through Thursday, Lisa, up around 12% on WTI crude, and we had some more weight to that rally this morning. I thought you were going to say thank you to OPEC Plus because they seem to really help the uh, energy to complex. To them as well. Pretty well. I think it's interesting when you look at earnings expectations, people back out energy companies every single time. <laughs> and they say, you know, earnings actually are expected to be up, and they have been up. And wow, look at all these positive earnings surprises. And then they're saying, actually, if you strip out energy companies, that's so much. But, Doesn't you know, that, okay. that remind you of the inflation story of the last 18 months? <laughs> yes. If you strip this out, strip that out, everything's okay. Pretty much. So you just tell your own story. Exactly. And that's what we're seeing. And how much is that really uh, what we see with each day? data point, pick the data point you want, craft the narrative, trade accordingly, and then get burned the next week. Let's pick up on the bond market. I like that. That was great. <laughs> Did you rehearse that? No. Okay. Twos, tens, and thirties. Look a little something like this. Two hours away from a jobs report, just around the corner. Your bond market trading as follows. A 10-year yield on my terminal right now looks like this. A 10-year at about 385. A two-year at 427. Yields up just a little bit, up a couple of basis points on twos. Later on tens, up a couple of basis points also. So they've been all over the place, right? I mean, talk about the volatility in a benchmark yield. Uh, it's been incredible. Real yields, however, are actually at the highest level going back to 2011 on the 30-year bond. I find this interesting. Real yields, inflation adjusted, or at least adjusted for the expectation applied by markets for inflation. I'm characterizing because I'm going to get a lot of hate mail saying that's not the inflation rate. It's not 3%, 2.5%. But anyway, uh, that, that you're seeing that continue to climb with this feeling the Fed's not going to be as accommodative going into the future. Do you know how many weeks we've been climbing higher on a 10-year yield? 10. Wow. This will be the 10th week. We're up about two basis points on the week, but this will be week number 10 of yields just climbing higher. It doesn't feel, though, like a steady climb, considering how whippy, to use your words, well, the sure. action has been. We were been. at 4% last week and exactly. backed away from that level on Wednesday, but still on the week, we close things up on Friday, 
That's where we are right now, up a couple of basis points to 385. Jobs number not too far away. Let's get there with Sarah House, Senior Economist at Wells Fargo. She's going to guide us through the details. Sarah, I've got a lot of nodes, and a lot of nodes really emphasise the participation rate in the labour market. Is that going to be a key one for you a little bit later this morning? <laughs> It's a huge element. So the participation is really the key to the Fed being able to pull off that soft landing. So getting more workers back, allowing more individuals to collect a paycheck, but at the same time, reducing some of those wage pressures and therefore the broader inflationary pressures. So I think the participation rate will once again be a huge focal point of today's report. The focal point this week was job openings. Job openings in America, the jobs report dropping by more than a million. Sarah, we were having a conversation around the desk whether that was just a result of people taking jobs away or those jobs being filled. What's your read on that? So I think it's probably a combination, but I'd lean perhaps more towards some of those jobs being taken away. If you look at the direction of what we've seen in other signals of labor demand, so for example, things like hiring plans from the NFIB, that's been trending lower since the start of the year. We see even consumers' own perceptions of job availability measured by the labor differential from the conference board come down. So I think directionally it's a sign that labor demand is weakening, but to the extent you do have more people coming back in, into the labor force, I think that could still help us put up some pretty decent jobs numbers in terms of that net gain in, in payrolls here over the next couple of months. How important are hourly earnings when you take a look at the wage inflation, the wage spiral, the stickiness that the Fed is concerned about, but is also necessary or enough is necessary to keep the economy from completely tanking? Right. So we need to see average hourly earnings growth slow if we're going to be consistent with 2 percent inflation over time, unless we get a massive surge in, in productivity, which based on the latest data, even if you smooth through some of the volatility, we're, we're just not seeing. And so I think while it does suggest that households are in for a pretty tough environment here, where it's likely that average hourly earnings will still continue to trail inflation here in the near term, it's unfortunately necessary and part of, of bringing down inflation, restoring that price stability side of the Fed's mandate. Sarah, we were just talking about the pain, and John was referencing the Jackson Hole speech and how Jay Powell was talking about how there was pain required to get inflation down. We have heard from some people saying, well, the Fed doesn't really want too much pain. They don't want people to lose their jobs. It becomes politically fraught. What is the appropriate amount of pain? And this is such a painful way to ask this question, uh, to use the same word over and over again. What's the appropriate amount to achieve what the Fed is looking for? So I don't think we or the Fed knows at, at this point. And so I think there is still an element of inflation that has been caused by just the distortions of the pandemic. So even though transitory has become unfashionable and kind of a dirty word, I think there is still some distortions that can be worked out, which could which could help the Fed. But I think it goes back to your previous question on, on wages and how there's still so much inflationary pressure coming out of the labor market that we can get some help on things like used autos, car prices, goods prices more generally to bring inflation down. But with wages still running close to 5 percent annualized, you will need to see some weakness in, in the labor market to, to get inflation back down to 2 percent for the long haul. There has been a bigger conversation over the last week, primarily because of the developments in the UK, that this Fed could back off on financial stability concerns and that we would hit those financial stability concerns before ultimately they'd be able, be able to achieve the set of conditions they want to see to bring inflation back towards target. Governor Wallace said this yesterday, along with the improved regulatory framework, I believe we have the tools in place to address any financial stability concerns and should not be looking to monetary policy for this purpose. The focus of monetary policy needs to be fighting inflation. Sarah, are you on the same side as that? Do, do you believe that's what the Fed will ultimately do? Allow the regulators to take care of financial stability and let monetary policy have the exclusive goal of bringing inflation back down? So I think policymakers will still put first and foremost the, the Fed funds rate and the goal of bringing down inflation as as the will remain their focal point. But I think when we, we look at the financial stability concerns aspect of that, I think we really need to see 
a, a lot more break and a lot more go wrong before the Fed begins to encompass that in, in their policy setting goals. So I think if you did see enough turmoil and, and enough weakness, then that could filter into the outlook for the broader economy when we think about uh, household wealth, businesses, hiring and investment intentions if they see so much volatility in, in markets. But I think for now, the Fed's going to remain just focused on inflation and, and not deal with the financial stability side of things until they really, really have to. When it comes to the United Kingdom, with financial stability, we were talking about the gilts market. We were talking about bonds and currency. In the United States, there's more discussion around the housing market and whether there could actually be some issue with financial stability there, not because there's leverage akin to what we saw in the lead up to the financial crisis in 2008, but simply from the household wealth standpoint and this question of how sustainable are mortgage rates near 7 percent. What's your view on how the Fed is looking at that other than, great, maybe it'll get the price down? So I think ultimately you know, you're still seeing households in very strong financial position. You know there is probably some more weakness to come out of housing and, and home prices, but that has been one of the frothier parts of of the market of the broader economy, and therefore contributing to that inflation perspective. And so this was really a segment that the Fed was calling out early on as an area of of concern. And so I think more of that just reflects some of that correction that that we're seeing. And I think you know it's it's something that the Fed. Is, is ultimately looking at, but it's just a piece of, of the puzzle when they're when they're thinking about the broader outlook and, and what it's going to take to bring inflation down. So just final question. We went through the estimates this morning in the Bloomberg survey. 255 is the median. But all the estimates, the range is really compressed this month. Sarah, does anything explain that? Through the pandemic and over the last two years, you've seen these massive ranges from economists, the low being maybe 100, the high being maybe six, 700,000. What do you think explains the tightening up of estimates on Wall Street? Well, I think part of it has to do with the fact that we are getting further into this cycle and the pandemic did throw a lot of distortions around the labor market from everything from to what extent supply comes back to some of the seasonal factors. And so I think as the cycle matures and uh, that, that we're seeing those estimates get get compressed as, you know, presumably there's there's less um, one way or one way or the other. But it's it's payrolls. You you never fully know. So we'll, we'll see what happens here in a few hours. Sarah, thank you, as always. Wells Fargo Bank looking for 275,000. Sarah House there. The Bank of England's Dave Ramston speaking at the moment. A range of headlines. And I'm going to pick up one because we were talking about financial instability there. Bank of England bond purchases designed to buy time. Yeah. Buy time for who? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Is it buy time for the trust administration or buy time for the central bank to understand the inflation that they're looking at and how much they're going to have to hike rates? What I find interesting is that they actually didn't buy bonds for several days in a row. The Bank of England refrained from buying bonds uh, both on Tuesday and on Wednesday. And in those days, yields surged. You saw a complete reversal. Uh, bonds sold off. And so you wonder how much October 14th really is in a pivotal moment, even though they say, well, we haven't used all of our firepower. It's just their presence in the market, a huge stabilizer uh, that perhaps people are underappreciating. The 30 years up 53 basis points this week in the gilt market. It's quite a move. And this is going to cause a lot of problems for a lot of households. And so how do you deal with that if you're a central bank trying to fight inflation? But also, where does the stability come into play? But do you think not being massively active is them drawing a distinction between addressing a bond market that was raising financial stability concerns and not doing yield curve control? Isn't that the effort here? It's a very, it's a very narrow distinction. And you're still hearing concerns about the LDI portfolios, about some of these pension funds and what they're doing with the uh, guilt. So this isn't, hasn't gone away. Where does financial stability begin and where does just normal functioning leave off? I it's like getting the feedback on the terminal because everyone else with a Bloomberg is smarter than I am. And me. So I, so I said, buy time for who? And someone messaged me immediately and said, buy time for the LDI schemes. That they need to reposition, which ultimately is the story, right? And that's clearly they haven't fully repositioned quite yet. From New York City this morning, payroll's just around the corner, 7.30 a.m. Eastern time. So not too long from now, we're going to catch up with Ellen Zetner of Morgan Stanley. Looking forward to that. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Less than two hours from now, we'll see if the hot U.S. labor market has started to cool off. Today's jobs report is forecast to show employers added 255,000 workers in September. Now, that would be the fewest in a month since a decline in late 2020. 
Even if that happens, it's not expected to convince the Fed to stop raising interest rates. President Biden has taken his first major steps toward decriminalizing marijuana. The president pardoned thousands of Americans convicted of possession of the drug. He also ordered a review of its legal status. Meanwhile, the president's actions have given marijuana stocks in the U.S. a jolt. They're rising in pre-market. Over in the U.K., the labor market is showing signs of cooling off. According to the Recruitment and Employment Confederation, companies are starting to impose hiring freezes because of, of pessimism about the outlook. Now, employees, they are staying put rather than applying for other jobs, but still pay continues to rise strongly because job candidates are in short supply. Bloomberg's learned that talks between Elon Musk and Twitter on his $44 billion takeover are stuck in debt financing. In a letter to the SEC, Musk's lawyers say the deal is contingent on receiving the proceeds of a $13 billion debt sale. According to an April filing, several banks underwrote the debt portion of that deal. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We just now need to stay the course. We said we're going to do this. We need to follow through and validate the expectations that we've set in markets. Until I see some evidence that underlying inflation has solidly peaked and is hopefully headed back down, I'm not ready to declare a pause. I think we're quite a ways away from a pause. Neil Kashkari, the Minneapolis Fed president, making his message loud and clear repeatedly yesterday. I think he spoke twice, didn't he, Lisa? Yes, I think so. OK, I think we'll hear from him again before the next Fed decision, no doubt. Like from New York City this morning. Good morning. Payroll's just around a corner. 255 is the median estimate. Jeffrey's at 350. A whole bunch of banks at 300K. Then another group at around 250,000. Goldman Sachs down at the bottom, down near the bottom at 200. Thousand. Yield to higher by about a basis point, 383.88. Equities going nowhere. On the S&P 500, Lisa, pretty much dead flat, unchanged on everything with the exception of crude. And we've had a big rally through the last four or five days. I, people don't understand just what the decline in demand actually is going to be versus the decline in production. And I think that that's a big question mark versus some response from the White House. I mean, this sort of sea of uncertainty is the reason why David Balin, not just in the crude market, but just more broadly, there's not a lot of conviction out there. What do you think the next giveaway from the White House will be if this is a bad jobs report? <laughs> Seems, you know, OPEC Plus doesn't go well, and then they come out with a big announcement on legalizing marijuana. Uh, you know, this is for you. You can, you can elaborate. What do you think? I, I'm not going to tell you what I think. That's for Anne-Marie. She's going to join us a little bit later. Anna Wong joins us now. <laughs> What's next? Chief U.S. Economist for Bloomberg. Anna, fantastic to have you with us in studio. Bloomberg Economics has a really big call for next year. You think Fed funds is going to go to about five. I think that's about something like 40 basis points above market pricing right now. What separates you from everyone else? Why do you think we can achieve that 5% Fed funds rate? Well, we have been holding that position since July. We were the first on Wall Street to make that call. And the reason why was because we per perceived a change in the reaction function of the Federal Reserve that I suspect that their um, ends, uh, the youth star, um, is higher than 4%. So the U star is the Nehru, basically. And um, and I, uh, based on the dot plot, I see that it's actually, f they, they think that it's about 4.4% right now. And I still think that that's a pretty optimistic assumption based on job matching data and, and you know, how difficult it is to hire based on, you know, what we heard from surveys. It just sounds like the U uh, star is more likely to be in the range of 4.5 to uh, to 5%, which which would mean that if you plug that number into any standard policy reaction function, that would imply a Fed funds rate five or higher, actually. The pushback we get, and I'm sure it's the pushback you get too, is that's unachievable. You will find out you're going to experience financial stability concerns long before you get there. How do you answer that one? Yeah, so as um, Governor Waller said very clearly, monetary policy tools are not designed for financial stability management. Um, so the Fed has put out lots of report on that. The the more appropriate tools is re actually macroprudential and microprudential, uh, um, you know, policies such as uh, you know tightening the the bank capital regulations, and monetary policy really is designed for 
stabilizing macroeconomic outcome. And do you think that they would lower interest rate or just pause to preempt a financial risk that they're not sure will happen at the expense of perhaps higher inflation? To them, it's a very costly bet. So that said, there are probably a number of studies being done by the Federal Reserve and by a number of others about how high rates could go before it does present a problem to the trillions of dollars of debt that have been issued during a time of incredibly low interest rates. Do you have some estimate of where things get a little problematic, considering the debt profile and the interest rates that people have currently and where they would have to refinance at? Right. I think so. That sort of test would be, um, got, um, you know, done in the supervision um, section, uh, which would be running some stress test. But I, I'm, I'm, I don't think that's a primary concern for, for the uh, FOMC committee. Just because, you know, uh, to to be frank. Um, Raising rates to this level will break some things. There will be an increase in defaults. I mean, in the 1990, in 1994, Mexico went into de you know default because of the Fed's, Fed's raising rates. That will happen, and they will. But their eyes are laser focused on inflation. How is this time different than in previous decades? Because the fiscal response is not possible in the same way that it has been in the past. Right. There is the inability to borrow at the cheap rates that people have gotten accustomed to. And we're already seeing that pushback in Europe. We're already seeing that pushback in England. How much does that factor in your, into your expectation of growth over the longer term? Yeah, I think I think what market has underpriced right now is the uh, depth of this um, recession. I think that given that the fiscal response, as you said, is limited because we are already at a very high trajectory of fiscal debt given our pandemic response, um, this this recession could could last longer, not only because the Fed decide not to, to ease, but also because there's not much a counter cyclical fiscal policy to have. But although I, I will say that one silver lining on the fiscal front is the state and local government. And Powell actually said this during the press conference that there's still a lot of buffer at the state and local government level. I mean, um, you know, the, the pandemic stimulus provided about one trillion of dollars to state and local government, and their coffers have been swelling with revenues due to higher property, um, you know, um, higher tax revenues from capital income gains over the last two years. So they actually have been given checks. I mean, I live in Virginia. I just got a $500 check. People who live in California. Do I need to move to Virginia? <laughs> I was wondering, why are we not <laughs> getting free still, money? Still getting <laughs> I mean, for what? Um, just because they have a lot of money in the in the coffer, and California people are, are getting thousand uh, like thousand dollar check, and and you know they're not the only states like Connecticut. You know they're giving out gas holiday of OPEC to drive um, drive oil price up to one hundred dollars. I'm pretty sure, given the fiscal you know um, buffers of the state and local government, we are yeah. going to see gas holidays provided by states. This sounded super bearish until the end. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's come down to, hasn't it? There's a couple of conversations going on here. We've had the soft landing versus half landing conversation a million times. The other one is they will break something. They won't break something. They'll risk breaking something. They won't even go there. <laughs> and that separates the bulls and the bears right now in this and, equity market too. And what Anna is saying is that inflation is very real. The potential for breaking something isn't real enough to really scare them away from doing this. And that's what's being reiterated from uh, Fed official after Fed official. So at what point does the market understand that and reprice accordingly, right? So when does the next question go to the Mike Wilson issue of what does the market, what should it look like if you discount any potential for uh, removing some of the hawkishness simply because of the possibility of something breaking. A number one difficulty, Anna touched on it, where does the counter-cyclical circuit breaker come from for the equity market bulls in a way that we saw it play out in the pandemic and pretty much every other crisis over the last several decades? Where does it come from? We just heard from state and local governments giving you a five hundred dollar check and giving you, you know, a thousand dollar gas holiday. I mean, how much is this really going to be the future until it runs out? Doesn't that make you more concerned about inflation? Completely, and not less. <laughs> well, I mean, this shows the whole issue with it's the United Kingdom and their counter plan. counter to what the central bank wants to achieve. Right. That basically the UK coming out with a plan to cap uh, energy costs with no discussion of capping demand. This becomes the problem. That's the politics, right? That's the politics, and that's why policy at the moment 
in a lot of places is increasingly in conflict. Priya Mirza is going to join us shortly from TD. Looking forward to that. Just an absolutely brilliant call from her earlier this year on yield curve inversion. Your yields right now up two basis points on a 10-year, 384.49. Your jobs report just around the corner on Payrolls Friday. This is Bloomberg. The market has been on a super high over the last few days. We've seen volatility across all asset markets. We might see some downturn dynamics driven by monetary policy. We're going to look at a higher for longer story, not necessarily a scenario where central banks are entertaining cuts next year. The Fed's really going to struggle to convince markets that it needs to do a total 125 basis points in those last two meetings of the year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. Payrolls 90 minutes away, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, your payrolls report. Not too far away, Lisa, we're looking for 255K. And what difference will it make? I mean, I'm sorry to sound existential. Sure, no, I'm with that, you. But in all honesty, uh, what, how big do the numbers have to really be to really change the narrative on Wall Street, which is that the Fed is going to go hard, that this economy is doing OK, that there is signs of slowing, but it's not enough to really cause some sort of a circuit breaker for the Federal Reserve. Changes the story going into the weekend, whatever the number might be, and Yay. then it gets hijacked by CPI next week. It's all about inflation. They're saying to us they're looking at the totality of the data. I've said this repeatedly, and you've said it too. There's one number that's a little bit bigger than all the rest, it's inflation. That's the one that matters. And that's what they're targeting more aggressively than anything else. They keep repeating it. They are willing to accept weakening in the jobs market. They're willing to accept a weakening in many other metrics in order to get that inflation down. Remember when we cared about University of Michigan sentiment for survey? For five minutes, for one print. And then it went away. And then we cared about jolts perhaps for five minutes, and then that's going to go away, and then CPI will come out, and we'll care about that, but people will be looking at core. How are they data dependent if the data is shifting in terms of its importance, really a real-time read on this economy? You answered your own question, didn't you? They just make it up as they go along. <laughs> <laughs> One well, week is I mean, this yeah. data point, yeah. the next meeting is another data point. Inflation's still running at 8%. I mean, come on, it gets ridiculous sometimes. We're going to look at the participation rate in the jobs report a little bit later this morning. If that starts to rise, get excited about a supply-side solution maybe. Inflation's still at 8%. Can they back off with CPI with an 8 handle? Can they really? Well, they can't, right? But David Bailey, Balin was really uh, highlighting this issue that you see in markets, which is people believe that the Fed will raise rates significantly, but they don't believe they will have to hold them there for that long. Even as the Fed comes out and says, yes, we will. Yes, we will. Yeah, no, no, we really will. And everyone says, no. And we're seeing that consistently in the pricing. And at what point does the Fed have the credibility to actually go through with what they're saying to actually convince markets to move in that direction? A word on Governor Waller yesterday afternoon. What do you make of that? Basically, he went through point by point every argument for the bulls and just said, you're wrong. Cold water. Cold Freezing. water. Freezing. Just basically, if you're worried about financial stability and you think that we're going to pause rate hikes because of financial stability concerns, you're wrong. That's basically what he said. He went through each argument and just absolutely tried to dash it. And at what point could it get more clear than that? You know, the bulls were saying back, no, you're wrong. You're <laughs> yes. wrong. And that's the conversation right now, right? It's not just soft landing versus hard landing in the economy. It's about whether they respond to financial instability risk or not. Do you think that the Federal Reserve has really regained credibility, given that we're having this discussion with the market challenging its premise? The amount they're talking, the idea that they're all on the same page, I think they don't think themselves they've regained that credibility yet, which speaks to why they're all singing from the same hymn shit repeatedly, repeatedly. And you saw that from Kashgari yesterday. And to your point, for Governor Waller to go through point by point by point, everything equity bulls would like to see and just push back, I think that tells you everything you need to know. They are listening to markets and they're saying, you guys are wrong. We have conviction. We're on the same page. And I think you said it really well, which is the fact that they're all speaking and speaking twice a day, three times a day to say the same thing, to go through each point that's being talked about in markets says quite a bit. You know what the bulls and bears all agree on? They just want that to stop. <laughs> I think that you're right about they, that. They really do. Here's the price action this Friday morning. Good morning to you. We shape up as follows in the equity market going into payrolls, looking for something in and around 255K, according to our survey. That's the median estimate so far. Futures unchanged on the S&P. Yields up just a little bit, up by a couple of basis points. 384.49 on a US 10-year. And euro dollar not doing much at 97.97. i tell you something that's done a lot this week. It's crude. Up another one percentage point. WTI Lisa, 89.37. What a 
muddle there. I just want to offer you this. Uh, Chris Webb on Twitter says that we still do care about University of Michigan sentiment because of the vibes. So there are some people who still care. 8.30 a.m. We get the September U.S. non-farm payrolls report. The high number from J.P. Morgan Asset Management's David Kelly, 389,000. The low of 199,000. How much will it actually make a difference at a time when average hourly earnings are still rising at an estimated 5% year over year, uh, marginally much more in certain areas? And, and frankly, as every single Fed official comes out and says, you know what, we are going to continue raising rates. Even if something breaks, we will hold them there. Today, we also hear from the administration on what the response is to the labor market report. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh on with our very own Jonathan Farrow on Bloomberg Television at 940 uh, a.m. And President Biden speaking later in the day. How do they spin this? Right. I mean, how do they talk about a good labor market? as a positive thing when you have a Federal Reserve pushing back and saying, actually, this is a problem based on where we need inflation to be and we cannot have a stable labor market given uh, that inflation is above 8 or 9 percent. And we'll get the spin because we do have a daily Fed show. And that Fed show today consists of New York Fed President uh, John Williams, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, again, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, again. How many times do they have to come out, John, and really just reiterate we're going to stay the course. And if you guys are pushing back, that's going to be on you when you get, uh, you know, basically your face ripped off. What are the vibes? What does that mean? You the know, vibes. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? How are you feeling today? Like the, the vibes of the economy. Yeah. Like just, okay. Like, how's it going? That's very sensitive. <laughs> you talk, feelings. Yeah. Feelings. Tom would sing that. I, I you know have that. no doubt. I was having I my head. What is he, he sings a song about feelings. Really? Anyway, I don't know what that is. So, yeah. All right. Priya Misra joins us now <laughs> to talk about the vibes of the bond market. <laughs> from TD Securities. Priya, great to catch up. We keep celebrating your wonderful call on yield curve inversion. You said negative 40, maybe negative 50, long before we got anywhere near those kind of levels. Right now, two tens, negative 43. Priya, you've got the crystal ball. What's driving this? Oh, it, I don't have the crystal ball. There's still a lot of uncertainty out there. But the reason for that inversion, which I have to say are... Uh, our payroll uh, uh, forecast sort of argues for more inversion or, or the inversion persisting is this idea that economy responds to a lag uh, or, or with a lag to uh, to high interest rates and the labor market's still tight. So we're looking for a 300,000 payroll. So another strong report. It's going to keep the Fed very much on their mission that they're going to continue to raise rates. You know, I think the, the front end is, is pretty fairly priced. We're looking for 5% terminal. The market's priced for 4.6. I mean, between 4.6 or 5, what's what's 40 base points among friends. So that's largely, I think, well-priced. It's the long end. I think what's happened is as the markets reprice the front end, it's also taken long end rates higher. And that's what I struggle with. I think the Fed's forecast of 4.4 on the unemployment rate by the end of next year looks very, very optimistic. I think if they're going to tighten, and they're all telling us, all of them, that they're going to tighten, they've also got QT tightening, that's going to start to slow things down significantly. And they may want to keep rates rates on, on, on hold higher for longer. But if the economy slows down meaningfully at some point, and this is what I'll stress, maybe it's not the end of 23, maybe it's a 24 story, but the 10 years pricing in a view over a long time, the Fed's going to have to cut a lot more than what's priced in because they need to take rates into accommodative territory. We're talking well into the future, but that's what the 10 years pricing in. So I think that 10 year, it feels unsustainable at 4%. So, you know, I, it's not so much now a front end call. My flattener call is much more that the long end is going to rally because we're going to see growth slowing and we're going to hear from a pretty tone deaf Fed well, that they're going to continue to raise rates. Priya, that's exactly where I wanted to go. You call the Fed tone deaf. How is the Fed being tone deaf right now? Well, I should clarify, they're not being tone deaf on inflation. I think they've recognized that there's an inflation problem. It's much too high. They want to keep expectations uh, anchored. Where they are tone deaf is the tightening in financial conditions and the slowing in the economy. I actually think it's the intended consequence of tightening. Where they're going to sound tone deaf is as the economy slows down and we're used to a Fed that responds. We're used to remember the preemptive cuts in 2019 where things started to slow down and the Fed said, you know what, let's cut a few times to be preemptive. I think the inflation picture just reduces that policy space for the Fed to sound preemptive at all. In fact, I'm gonna argue they're gonna be late. They're going to want the data to tell them to start to cut. And the data is going to slow down slowly because a lot of the data that they're looking at, CPI, labor market, these are highly lagging indicators. So by the time they slow down, we'll be well into a recession, which is why I think they'll have to cut more. But they are going to be tone deaf to slowing in the economy, which the equity market is going to keep tantruming about. 
You said something that I really want to pick up on about the 10-year Treasury yield going much lower in the future, and people are discounting how much the Fed's going to have to lower rates uh, when we do get that kind of downturn. What seems fair value? How do you push back against people who say we are entering a higher inflationary regime with a Fed that cannot afford to be as accommodative as it was over the past few decades? Sure. So I would separate that tenure into real rates and inflation expectations. Now, if you believe, and we're sort of in that camp, that inflation will come down. There's base effects next year. You know, commodity prices are already lower, notwithstanding what OPEC did. But, you know, if inflation gets down to, say, 3% by the end of next year or 2024, then it's really the, a question of real rates. Can the economy handle higher real rates? And there is this narrative building that we are entering some new normal, or maybe we're going back to the old normal, that the economy can handle higher interest rates. I know leverage is not as much of an issue, but I don't think productivity or the potential output for the economy or potential growth is that much higher. I don't think we can handle much higher real rates. So 10-year real rates, well north of 1%, that's going to slow the interest-sensitive sectors first. That's going to spill out further. So you know, I, if you're nervous about inflation or you think inflation might stay high for longer, buy those real rates. Because I think the economy's ability to withstand higher real rates has not changed. I think there's a lot of evidence that our star or real equilibrium real rates is lower. And so maybe, you know, you can you can decompose your view on, on the tenure and just have more faith in that real rate component, which is where we come out, that those real rates are much too high. Um, they, they won't be able to be sustained for that long. Brilliant. I've got 20 seconds, just some very, very quick, short, snappy scenario analysis. Yields up, yields down. If we get a big upside surprise, 400K, can you tell me if it's yields up, yields down, and the same with 100K a little bit later? How does this play out in the bond market? Well, it depends on which yields. I think if it's front end, absolutely higher because the Fed's going to keep going. They're not stopping. The long end, I think, will also move higher, but that's what I would look to, you know, start to go long. 100K, I think... I mean, it should be lower rates, but further out the curve, because the Fed's telling you that 100K is not going to deter them from going 125 this year in, in, in terms of hikes or continuing hikes next year. So I think it's which part of the curve, but 100K is certainly bullish for that long end. And really, I you know, I would say equities is negative in either scenario, because it's either you have a hawkish Fed or a slowing economy. It sounds like you're buying tens in either scenario, too, ultimately. Priya, wonderful to catch up. Thank you. Priya Misra of TD. Your jobs report isn't too far away, 8.30 Eastern time. Well, before we get there, we'll catch up with Ellen Zentner of Morgan Stanley and we'll catch up with Nadia Lovell of UBS. Looking forward to it. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. President Biden is worried that Vladimir Putin's threats to use tactical nuclear weapons are real and could lead to, quote, Armageddon. At a fundraiser in New York, the president said the U.S. is trying to figure out the Russian leader's off-ramp. Putin renewed his nuclear threats when he announced the annexation of territory in Ukraine. The Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded to human rights activists from Ukraine, Russia and Belarus. They were cited for documenting war crimes, human rights abuses and abuse of power. At the same time, the chair of the Nobel Committee criticized Vladimir Putin and the government in Belarus for suppressing activists. Investors and the Fed will be watching today's monthly U.S. jobs report closely. It's forecast to show that employers added 255,000 jobs in September. Now, that would be the smallest number since a decline in late 2020. Still, it would be an indication that the labor market remains strong. The report comes out at 8.30 New York time. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Look to me, according to our reports, headed for four and a half to four and three quarters percent by sometime next year, which, given how fast we've been raising interest rates, is likely to be the springtime. Charles Evans of the Chicago Fed. All of the doves sounding very, very hawkish. Can you make sense of this, Lisa? 
you know, the, I keep going Kashkari, back to... Kashkari, Evans, yeah. take your pick. And they're the most hawkish among the group. And we have James Bullard, who might end up being dovish uh, later on because he doesn't necessarily see the need to continue hiking rates as dramatically. How much, though, does this really highlight that the pain is being felt by inflation and what that's doing to household budgets, not by the potential unemployment and not by the potential weakness in an economy that has not yet been realized? Next stop for this discussion, payrolls, one hour and 12 minutes away. From New York City this morning, good morning. The price action going into payroll shaping up as follows in the equity market on the S&P 500. Futures right now just unchanged, going absolutely nowhere. Yields are higher by about a basis point or so on a 10-year to 383.67. Euro dollar not doing much. 98 on euro dollar. Tell you what's doing something, crude. 89.28. Positive one full percentage point. Before today, we were already rallying hard. WTI through Thursday up around 12 percentage points. What did we call the SPI yesterday? The Strategic Midterm Reserve? Yeah, that's and we got a little bit of pushback. I got a little bit of pushback. Did you? People, yeah, people saying that this is an appropriate use because it's helping to support the financial stability of a nation that's going through a volatile time. And okay. I can see the skepticism in your furrowed brow. And I do wonder whether that is echoed by other people or whether they don't care. Is this a skeptical face? No, just like when you're going like this. Come yeah, on. Come on. So I'm, I asked Francisco Blanche of Bank of America about this, about the unintended negative consequences that come from the politicization of SPR. Take a listen to this. We have had no oil crisis yet. Uh, and the key word here is yet. Uh, if you lose your ability to temper price appreciation, um, because there is an actual physical disruption of molecules in crude oil, uh, you're going to wish you had those barrels in store. Um, that's, I think, a big problem releasing the, the SPR right now. Bridge. Team coverage starts right now with Maria Tadeo in Prague and Amory Hordern in Washington, D.C. MH is day two of OPEC plus fallout. What's the latest? Well, latest is that, Jonathan, what you're hearing on Capitol Hill is more of this idea, uh, at least from uh, lawmakers, even though they're back uh, campaigning for the midterms, what they are talking about is Saudi Arabia, and they're talking about NOPEC, this idea and this legislation that for really 20 years has kicked around, but no president would really ever sign this, right, because the repercussions. And this would basically give the Justice Department the leeway to go out and sue some of these countries a part of OPEC. Now, right now, even though this is potentially just an idea, you have Senator Chuck Grassley saying that he wants to put it as an amendment to the defense spending bill. His inbox yesterday, what I got from him, was my bipartisan no pact act would crack down on these tactics by the foreign oil cartel. And what's interesting is I asked Amos Hochstein, Biden's top energy advisor, about this. That statement from Jake Sullivan and Brian Deese was this a nod to NOPEC? And he said, I'll let you read the tea leaves. So the administration is definitely sending a warning shot. And we should say that even just the mention of NOPEC, this would give some Gulf officials nightmares. Although they're kind of pushing back. And Maria, I'd love you to weigh in on this. We heard from them that the uh, oil price caps for Russia that Europe is currently talking about was part of the reason for their wanting to cut production because of the extra uh, insecurity, the extra uncertainty introduced by this. Do you understand what these price caps are and how they're factoring into this political decision? Well, I think a lot of people are still trying uh, well, to understand well, exactly how the... Oh, go oh, yeah. for it, Maria. Take it up. <laughs> Go for it, Emery. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll quickly say my thoughts on the price cap, and I'll hand it over to Maria, because obviously this is a huge issue for Europe. U U.S. officials want this to happen, but it's the Europeans that are really going to have to be the ones that, to implement it, because they're the ones that have sanctioned that Russian oil, and also it's the Greeks and the, uh, the Cypriots who really have uh, the transactions for this in terms of the shipbuildings. But from the OPEC side, what they don't like a lot of producers is the fact that they think this would send a and set a very bad precedent. The fact that the United States could decide what a producer is selling their oil at. Maria, what's your view? 
<laughs> uh, well, I, I would say it's day two of a summit. It is 1.30. By my standards, in 30 minutes, it's time to break up for lunch. And European leaders are still locked up in a room trying to figure out what they want to do with uh, energy prices. Now, to me, what is striking is that I've heard nothing here. This is not a conversation, the oil at all. And again, this goes back to the fundamental issue. This is something that is incredibly political. It's domestic agenda in the U.S. But when you look at the domestic agenda for the Europeans, their focus at this point, I would say, almost most exclusively is on gas. They're still debating this price cap. Again, I can tell you there's five different options on the table that is part of the problem. They can't agree on a solution because they still haven't figured out which of the options could actually uh, fly. The other thing today uh, that is being debated, and this is potentially new, is the European Union saying perhaps we should revisit some of the tactics that we used in the pandemic. That means that we buy gas as one single unit, so you don't have European countries that essentially go out on the market and outbid each other. Now, this was something that the French president floated. He said perhaps it could be a good idea. Now we buy not as individuals, but as the EU. The question is, however, who decides who gets what? And if you're Germany, what you care about is having a lot of reserves this winter. The two of you, so polite to each other. Maria Tadeo <laughs> in Prague, MH <laughs> down in DC. You see that? Just refuse to step on each other. Well, uh, yeah, you know, some it's people... It's Bloomberg surveillance. Yeah, I was about it's to the, say. It's the home of cutting when, people off. Yeah, I was, was going to say, when do we get uh, to another level? But this is one reason why, too, uh, some of the Zoom communication and the delays were really problematic during the pandemic. I will just say, because you start talking and then it's like this awkward, well, I, do you let the I, other person go? I get it. Come on, this is, wasn't this like one of the big sort I, of pandemic? I hated of doing pandemic. TV from home and radio for oh, It was brutal, it, right? It drive me insane. So I'm just, I, I, give, them, I give them credit because it's not as easy. There, there were the moments case. where everything would go silent and I had no idea if we were in commercial break or not. So I would just stare down the barrel of the camera and talk for five minutes on my own. My children would be eating breakfast on the couch right. and they would be really quiet, but they would you know, be kind of creeping over to the sink and I'd just be like, oh, come on, come on, monetary let's, policy. Let's not reminisce about that time, <laughs> all right? Payroll's an hour away. We're looking for 255 k Throughout the whole pandemic in the last couple of years, the range has been so wide and all of a sudden it's really, really tight and I wonder what that tells you. I mean, honestly, maybe it's that nobody really wants to take a, a real big wild guest. Maybe it's just because things are chugging along. And when do we hit that precipice where we see a real shift that really changes the discussion, where we start to care a little bit more about jobs report? Because it is important, but it's not really going to move the needle today. Which one's the high? JP Morgan Asset Management. Yep, David 389. Kelly. 389. Goldman near the low at about 200K. The jobs number, 60 minutes away. We'll catch up with Alan Zetner and Morgan Stanley as well in just a moment. Looking forward to that. In studio here in New York, live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg Surveillance for our audience worldwide. One hour away from the payrolls report, the price action shaping up as follows on the S&P and on the Nasdaq 2. Futures going absolutely nowhere on the S&P 500. The Nasdaq 100 down about a third of 1%. The S&P through Thursday up around about 4.43% on the week so far. Driven by what's happened in energy, the energy names on the S&P 500 as a group up 15% in the previous four days. Brent and crude shaping up as follows. WTI through Thursday up around 12 percentage points and we add to the gains this morning up by more than 1% on WTI crude at 89.47 on Brent crude 95.42 up by a little more than 1%. So that's the connection between the commodity market and equities this morning and through the week. Let's talk about the bond market too. The 10 year coming very close to grinding out another weekly gain on the yield for a 10th consecutive week. Yields higher by two basis points on a 10 year right now Lisa at about 384.49. Forty-nine, And the move in real yields, really, we cannot overstate how significant that is. And Priya was talking about how that really does shift some of the expectations for risk asset pricing based just on that and how sustainable that is. I, I want to take a look at a couple uh, single names, in particular in the semiconductor space, because AMD reported earnings last night, and they actually said that their third quarter sales uh, projections missed expectations by more than a billion dollars. They said that things are moving very quickly. Those shares are down more than 5% in pre-market trading, but there's 
echoes what we've heard from Samsung. This echoes what we've heard from Intel and NVIDIA. And all of those shares down very sharply year to date. If you take a look, you're seeing more than 50 percent declines for AMD and for NVIDIA. Intel shares down nearly that much. John, you wonder at what point this is a signal for something broader than just, you know, a rapidly shifting cycle where people were buying personal devices. They built up inventories and now they're not seeing the same orders. Right. Is it that kind of stop and go in that specific sector or is this a broader statement that's going to hit Apple, that's going to hit the other big tech names in a fundamental way, aside from just valuation because of real yields, because of some of the changes in uh, monetary policy? Our reporting around Apple in the last week suggesting there's a bit of a demand issue. The demand is faltering with the iPhone. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. Remember the original Chris call, which is wait for the weakness that will come the first half of 2023. He's saying in the earnings it's going to come much, much quicker now. And his views changed in the last couple of weeks. And if AMD, if Samsung, if Intel, if all of these chip makers are any indication of a broader economic slowdown, particularly in the chip sector, particularly in some of the electronic devices that people bought uh, feverishly during the pandemic, then this is setting a pretty bearish signal. Will we see some of that data in the labor market? I'm pleased to say that joining us around the table, Ellen Zetner, the chief U.S. economist of Morgan Stanley. Ellen, good morning. Great to have you with us. Good morning. Went through the preview note, went through a couple of the numbers. And again, I said this to Sarah House of Wells Fargo. It's interesting. A lot of you are highlighting what you expect in participation. Yeah. How important is that going to be in 60 minutes time? It's really important. Uh, I think headline is what markets are going to be focused on here because the Fed needs to see a uh, substantial slowdown in job gains. But participation from a medium term standpoint, you know, we need to see more flows back into the labor market. And immediately we look at prime age labor force participation. So you strip out those that are less than 25 years old. You strip out those that are older than 54 years old. And we call that the prime age participation. We want to see those flows continue to come back into the labor market because regardless of how many job gains uh, you've got, that's what's going to help you take pressure off of wages. Uh, and that's a problem for the been a problem for the Fed when inflation is that high. That's the ultimate bullish solution for people yeah. in this equity market that we get this positive evolution on the supply side. What do you think the job openings, what do you think the message is from the job openings decline that we got earlier this week when it comes to the story of getting a supply side response? Yeah, so I think of job openings as uh, missed, right? So what we've been hearing from companies since the summer, uh, and this comes from our equity analysts, we do these department huddles with our equity analysts. And companies have been telling us, look, we hired the need to fill positions. We've had these nice-to-have positions that have just been open for a long time, and we've not been able to fill them. So guess what? They're going to go away, into the mist, right? And that's the drop in job openings that we're seeing now. Now, that typically leads slower hiring or slower payroll gains. So that's actually encouraging to us that we are going to be right and you're going to see a more substantial slowdown in job gains. It sounds terrible. Economists are the worst, right? We get so excited at bad data. Um, but that's what the Fed needs to see for them to be comfortable that they're really dinging the real economy. The fact that we haven't seen worse data, talking about sort of the perverse uh, inclination right now of economists that want to see inflation slow, the fact that we have not seen that weakening, how far away are we from the possibility of soft landing? How much further are we than we were, say, three months ago? Well, I, I you know, it is the case that all year, right, revisions have been going higher for inflation, lower for growth. Inflation has now moved into the very sticky parts of the economy. Um, I think it's going to be very hard to get uh, a substantial slowing in rental prices, which is the biggest component the Fed is uh, concerned with. Um, you've just got to get the unemployment rate higher. And so I think as we're moving into next year, you are going to see more evidence of the trend in inflation softening, right? Not a big drop, but softening at the same time that you've got a real drawdown in these job gains. So that sort of sluggish, glo uh, sl sluggish global economy, sluggish U.S. economy, um, with the evidence of that, right, would tell you, okay, we can be more certain that this trend is going to continue. That's one reason why, you know, when we talk about the Fed pivot, what does that mean? All right, does it mean they go from hiking to cutting, hiking to stopping? To me, the first pivot is hiking to slowing those hikes. And I think that's when markets and risk assets really grab onto that message because that's the beginning of the end of the hiking cycle. As soon as you indicate you're comfortable to even slow the pace, and that's what we're waiting for. Is it appropriate, though, at that point, 
to really uh, feel bullish on risk assets based on the fact that then you have seen the weakness that will necessarily lead to weaker profits, perhaps a persistently higher unemployment rate, if you believe the stickiness that a lot of people speak about once people lose their jobs. Yeah, so I think this is the biggest debate um, that economists are having with the strategists, right? Because um, in one sense, you're saying, okay, I'm really uh, encouraged that we're getting to the end of this hiking cycle. Um, but if you're getting to the end of the hiking cycle because things are really bad, um, then is can that be a real bullish sign? Um, and so you've got to have some signs that the economy is slowing, but isn't, isn't going to be disaster, right? And we have GDP growing half a percent next year. Now, statistically speaking, it's no different than putting a negative sign in front of it. So it is a very, we are walking a knife's edge um, difference between a soft and a hard landing. Some banks have a negative sign. Bank of America is one. Mike Gapen caught up with Lisa and I earlier this week. And he told us that he's expecting the first three quarters to be negative growth next year. And we asked him if the Federal Reserve would be cutting with that backdrop. And he said, no, if they're going to cut, it's going to start at the end. December 23, is that what yeah. he said? Something like that. Ellen, do you foresee a scenario that could play out where we get a recession and they don't cut interest rates? Well, the, the, they will cut interest rates and it will be recession in, in Gapin's view, right? But the Fed is lagged, right? Because they have to wait for the body of evidence of the data to come in. And it can be quite lagged when you get evidence of negative straight quarters. Um, it all comes down to financial markets at that point. You can be in recession with still high inflation, but are markets in disarray? Is liquidity hampered? Are credit conditions really deteriorating? That then is why the Fed would then need to respond if a recession is coming with that. I mean, think about it. We got negative growth in the first half of this year, and they didn't cut rates, right? So we also have the Fed cutting in December 2023. That's later than the market expects because inflation is still going to be quite high, even with growth as weak as we have it. What does this mean for longer term expectations of growth, given that this economy is based, predicated on rates that are incredibly low, on debt that's been issued at near zero rates or benchmark rates, and that suddenly we're talking about protracted periods of time with north of 4 percent Fed funds rate? How much slower will growth have to be in the world's biggest economy over the next five years? So I would think of it as as separating a cyclical from a longer run view. If you think about longer run dynamics that affect potential growth in the economy, nothing's really changed, right? The demographic backdrop is the same. Um, productivity metrics are the same and expected to be about the same. And so uh, it's one reason why you don't see the Fed really revise their estimates for longer run potential growth in the economy. Cyclically, though, um, we've got to digest higher rates than we've had in quite some time. Now, what matters is the, uh, the um, shape of the debt that you're carrying. So households uh, are locked in at low fixed rates. 97% of mortgages outstanding today are being held at a 30-year fixed rate, and the effective yield on all of that is about 3.4%. So as the Fed is raising interest rates, the bulk of the household balance sheet, those, those um, uh, interest expenses are not changing. Um, for corporates, right, we hit uh, COVID rates zero, and they refied, and so now that wall of debt that was coming due has now been pushed out to about 2028. 20, so you're talking about the next three, four years, right? And because of the composition of the balance sheet of households and corporates, it's not as big of a problem as you would think uh, in terms of growth. It sounds like all roads lead to a higher terminal rate given everything you've just said? Do we have to push it higher to slow this economy down? Yeah, well, in, in, there's a near-term uh, neutral rate, and you hear the Fed talking about that. Inflation is high, labor market is tight, so they've got to go much further. They don't know how much further, and that's the, that's the problem. None yeah. of us do, right? Um, longer run, again, the dynamics haven't really changed, so at some point, in a beautiful world, and their, their forecasts are always in a beautiful world, um, you start to normalize policy back toward that 2.5% neutral rate that they think the, the economy should be running at. Why are their forecasts always in a beautiful world? <laughs> why why is that? That's, that's the modeling. The models always look to return you to this, this beautiful, you know, it's Hellenic beauty in these forecasts, right? <laughs> and so over time, as they stretch their forecasts on further and further, they're forecasting out to 2025. If any economist sure. tells you they're accurate more than two quarters out, they're just lying. <laughs> um, I mean, guaranteed you will be wrong. You, you can get the narrative right. 
but guarantee you the numbers will be wrong. Um, but the longer you go, right, the, the you're, these models are just going to return you back to this beautiful equilibrium. The Hellenic beauty of the Federal Reserve. That. We need to cut that and play that <laughs> for the next <laughs> Over and show. over again, every time someone speaks. Ellen, just awesome to have you in the studio with us. Thanks, guys. Thank Looking for 250K you. today, right? Yeah. 250k from the team at Morgan Stanley. And thank you very much. Your payrolls report not too far away, 8.30 Eastern time. Steve Englander of Standard Charter is going to join us shortly. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Less than an hour from now, we'll see if the hot U.S. labor market has started to cool off. Today's jobs report is forecast to show employers added 255,000 workers in September. Now, that would be the fewest in a month since a decline in late 2020. Now, even if that happens, it's not expected to convince the Fed to stop raising interest rates. President Biden has taken his first major steps toward decriminalizing marijuana. The president pardoned thousands of Americans convicted of possession of the drug. Now, he also ordered a review of its legal status. Meanwhile, the president's actions have given marijuana stocks in the U.S. a jolt. They are rising in pre-market. China is showing its clout on the world stage. The United Nations blocked the debate on China's human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Just weeks after publishing a report on the matter, the U.S. proposed draft resolution at the U.N. Human Rights Council was narrowly blocked. China has rejected allegations that it abuses Uyghurs and other Muslims. And it was Bank of America's last remaining legal holdout from the financial crisis. B of A has agreed to settle claims by AMBAC Financial regarding residential mortgage-backed securities for more than $1.8 billion. The bank says it expects a pre-tax expense of about $354 million for the third quarter. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We have tools in place to address any financial stability concerns, and we should not be looking to monetary policy for this purpose. The focus of monetary policy needs to be on one thing, fighting inflation. Christopher Waller there, the Federal Reserve governor, pushing back, pushing back hard, I'd say, Lisa, against those that think this Fed is going to pause over financial stability concerns. How much do they read the analyst notes on Wall Street and go through <laughs> point by point and decide, OK, no, no. I mean, I keep going back to this. You think that's, that's how that like. speech was put together? I mean, otherwise, what are they responding to? Is it other Fed officials that are saying, what about financial stability concerns? Is it Andrew Bailey coming out and being sure. like, guys, you have to think about this. What happens if you're LDI? Oh, wait a second. You guys don't have the same kinds of schemes well, the, in the, the, US. the Bank of England started it, right? Yes, exactly. They started the conversation in a bigger way. Did you get the note from Steve Englander? I did. Transitory disinflation yet again. And when I read that, I had to check the date to make sure that it was actually dated October 6th and, and not October 6th, 12 months ago. All these dirty words now. Disinflation, I, I transitory, know. put together. But take your pick. Yep. Steve's on right now. Steve Englander of Standard Chartered. Steve, <laughs> I had to read it twice. Transitory disinflation yet again, really? Well, the, what I meant was that, you know, um, you know, People who are fans of a strong dollar, because they say it leads to disinflation. Uh, we've had strong dollars, episodes of very strong dollars before, and unless you think it's going to last forever, um, the dollar comes back and 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 you give it back. You give back the disinflation. So you know, to me, is it's not a particularly compelling argument. I mean, the um, the backbone of of inflation has been goods inflation through most of this this period. That's what should have been affected by the dollar. It didn't have that much of an impact. Um, and yet what we're seeing is that the dollar is causing a lot of problems globally in emerging markets and, and elsewhere, uh, elsewhere. So um, it was a case to be made that if, if you think that you're getting benefits from the strong dollar, that this reverse currency war is, is kind of you know, playing your way, that you're probably fooling yourself. OK, so basically, just to simplify this, strong dollar for longer? Well, it could be strong for longer. It doesn't mean it's desirable that it be strong for longer. I mean, it, it, 
you know, obviously depends, um, you know, on how risk appetite goes. Dollar's been very much propelled by uh, risk aversion, and it depends on, on rate differentials and how the U.S. economy goes. And that's what we're waiting on at the, you know, for payrolls this, this morning. We were talking about uh, Chris Waller and, and really sort of shedding some cold water on this idea that financial stability concerns could cause the Federal Reserve to really back away from any of their rate hiking plans. And, and I think the strong dollar very much falls into that question, especially as people talk about financial stability concerns outside of the U.S. At what point, based on how much uh, strengthening we've already seen versus major currencies, at what point, from your vantage point, does it really create something of a destabilizing effect on the rest of the world? Well, I, I think when when you begin to see you know CDS blow out, when you begin to see spreads uh, widen, and you know from the point of view of the Fed, when you if you begin to see domestic fin financial institutions under pressure because there's some exposure abroad that you know they weren't aware of and the market wasn't aware of that's beginning to come out, I think it it does become material. You know, saying that you're never going to react to this is like, you know, telling your kid you're never going to, you know, bail him out if he overspends his allowance. You know, there's a point at which you you kind of throw in the towel. Um, they don't want to do it clearly, but there is a point at which they will. Well, Steve, you've nailed it then. It's about signaling something. And there's a difference between what they want to signal and what they'll actually do. Steve, I want to talk about the signal that you would take from a Fed that starts delivering some kind of decelerating rate hikes from 75 to 50 to 25, if they start to lay the groundwork for that, how you think the dollar responds to it? Well, I think the dollar would fall. Um, and and I, I think, you know, that would be a good thing. Um, I, I think it would be sensible, um, even though our forecast is that they do 75 at the next meeting, I think it would be sensible to decelerate to 50 and kind of say, look, you know, 50 is a big chunk. If it turns out that that's not enough, we can add a hike in um, or two in, in 2023 to, you know, bring things to where we want them to be. But there are enough signs that the economy is slowing down that I don't think um, you have to have your 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 foot kind of jamming on the brakes at this stage to the same degree um, that we've had the last couple of meetings. Steve, within G10, how would you like to position for that? Is it against the Japanese yen? What would you do? I, I think the two currencies that have a real chance of appreciating if there's a pivot, one is the yen because it's been super sensitive to rate differentials. And I think uh, an improvement in risk appetite, everybody hates the commodity currencies now. Aussie is really, really cheap. Um, I think that there's some room there for it to, you know, under 65, there's room there for it to pick up on any kind of good news. So it's kind of a barbell view. Steve, just on the Aussie, is that a commodity story for you or the fact the RBA is back in a way? What matters more? Uh, I, I, th I think it's a risk appetite story. Everybody is so down on, on where activity is going and where, uh, risk appetite is going and it's it's playing out, you know, not particularly through the commodity side, but it's, it's just the, the beta that Aussie has. How difficult is it to go long the yen proactively in case there is some sort of shift from the Federal Reserve? Well, I, you know, actually, I don't think it's that hard. Um, you know, I, we, we put out a piece earlier this week arguing that the, the Japanese intervention had been reasonably successful, not a home run, but maybe a ground rule double or something. Um, they spent 20 billion and, and, you know, for, you know, a week or two without doing anything, um, you could see material impact in terms of the way the yen was trading, even when other currencies were selling off. So I, I think that if, you know, they can successfully put a, impose a ceiling and if they were more aggressive and if they gave some hints that they were, you know, eventually going to back out of yield curve control, I think they'd be very successful in strengthening the yen. Steve, awesome to hear from you, sir. Steve Englander of Standard Chartered. I think we're all waiting to see what happens at a Bank of Japan once Governor Kuroda steps aside, aren't we? There's Does yield curve control go with him? There's a theory that that's what they're waiting for. He leaves. He's got, what, six months, five months Something left? Something like that. And that when he leaves, then they'll allow it to go away. But he's not going to let it to go away under his watch because it's basically his flagship program. He did this. And so he's going to keep it in place. What does the bond market look like? I still wonder what the bond market looks like that morning if they step away from yield curve control. It cannot be just ripping the Band-Aid off because the dislocations, at least based on valuations right now, would be so dramatic. When people talk about the yen, they say the bigger problem is in the Japanese bond market that is not a market. It does not trade. It does not have active uh, bids and, and asks. It doesn't have people who are accustomed to finding market pricing. I wouldn't necessarily express that in the JGB market, but I'd be itching to do something somewhere else. 
in sort of highly liquid government bond markets elsewhere that you'd expect yields to shift a whole lot higher off the back of that decision from Japan. What I suspect you're referring to is longer term U.S. Treasury yields. And that is what a lot of people are saying will happen. Actually, that is the bare case for longer term treasuries is if there is some removal of yield curve control in Japan, the ripple effects through the U.S. markets will be significant. That was Steve Englander of Standard Chartered. They're looking for 250K. Other banks are as well. Just a long list of sort of they're all tight and packed up around 300K, 250, 200. Yeah, and you made the point, and it's a good point. I honestly don't know what to make of it, which is the reason why I've had nothing particularly intelligent to say on it. But when you said, you know, why is it that for so long... I was long, just wondering. You know, I have no clue. But, you know, a wide range <laughs> for ages. Like, and then now it's a tight range, and I really have no answer. But, you know, people are smart as Well, it doesn't matter. In about 35 minutes, you get the real deal. The jobs <laughs> number's going to drop. The median estimate in our survey so far, about 255K. The number's going to drop in about 34 minutes. In just a moment, we'll catch up with Nadia Lovell of UBS. Looking forward to it. From New York, this is Bloomberg. What's driving inflation is low pay, low wage, low skill jobs. They want to see some moderation in the labor market as well as some better inflation numbers. We got to look at where the, the situations are fragile, and where you know the higher for longer story could potentially break things. I certainly think we can live with interest rates being much higher. If we have some positive surprises, the market's looking for good news. I think it'll react. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Payrolls 30 minutes away, live from New York City this morning for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Counting it down to payrolls Friday, 30 minutes away. Bramo futures totally unchanged. So exciting. Everyone's really excited for this data point. It's going to be the most important data You're point. you sarcastic. Until next week. CPI. Until CPI. <laughs> well, no, I think it's going to be important to see how the labor market is progressing. But I think that right now to understand that this is going to have any determining effect on the Fed's path, or the narrative around it is a bit of a stretch. So then where does the marginal trading come from, right? How do we interpret whether this is closer to a soft landing or whether this is closer to the Fed going harder uh, with respect to rate hikes? So let's take a bank that's had some big calls for big hikes this year. City, the team led by Andrew Hollenhorst, they just published a downside surprise to payrolls. That would be 100K or below for him and the team. Following the 1.1 million plunge in job openings would serve as a first sign that tighter financial conditions are gaining traction on the tight, labor market. This speaks to what Bruce Kasman over at J.P. Morgan was saying, that several months of 100,000 uh, or 100, uh, yeah, 1,000 jobs being created yep. consecutively would cause some sort of pause, some sort of reassessment by the Federal Reserve. Will they signal that, though, because they need the markets to remain tight? I mean, really, this is an honest question I because they've been coming out and they really have been basically watching the markets and saying, guys, stop with the hope. Just quit it. If they start to signal that we're going to go from 75 to 50 to 25 You've got a decent idea of how people think this market responds to that. And then we also know at the same time this Fed wants to keep financial conditions tight, tight, tight. It's kind of bizarre, isn't it, that all these Fed speakers are out there basically doing something that Kashgari talked about a few weeks ago and no one's touched since. They're trying to cap financial conditions and make sure that the market doesn't run away. They are very concerned about inflation. They want all the help that they can get. And I, what we're grappling with right now is that monetary policy does not have that many levers to, play, to, to push and pull. So the one that they have is making sure that markets appropriately tighten, that it is difficult for you to be able to raise money at the same kind of pace. And so they're going to go with that at the same time that people are wondering whether the labor market is not perhaps the appropriate place to be looking for what's to come. So you said it. When we get to the CPI report next week, will we even be talking about the data point that drops in 27 minutes' time? I'm going to go ahead and say that that will depend on whether it's coherent with the narrative that the CPI print uh, highlights. If it is coherent, then yes, it will still matter. If it's not, then CPI will take precedence. OK, well done. Nicely framed. <laughs> Futures unchanged yes. on the S&P. The jobs report 27 minutes away. Hour after that, the opening bell. Market set up as follows. Yields going nowhere on a 10-year, 383.27. Euro dollar not doing much either. 97, 93 unchanged there. So you've got unchanged futures, unchanged euro dollar, unchanged 10-year. The thing that does change is crude this week. Crude has been absolutely flying over the last week, both the commodity and the energy names on the S&P 500. The commodity through Thursday up by around about 12%. The energy names on the S&P, Lisa, Bramo, a 15% move in four days. 
And this is because of OPEC Plus coming out, saying that they're going to cut production by 2 million barrels, although the actual cut won't actually be that much because they haven't hit their production targets. This really raises an issue, though, of, first of all, spare capacity and how much higher longer-term oil prices could really go. And I know you were speaking with Francisco Blanche about this yeah. over at Bank of America, and this really feeds to the narrative, it's going to be a tough winter. He has some concerns about how we're using the SPR. He does. How it's been politicized and the risk that we could perhaps come across next year if we have a real crisis in the crude market. He was keen to point out we haven't had one yet. And so if you end up with some of the lowest levels in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve still there going back to the early 1980s, what kind of ability do you have to really offset some of those prices? And people raise the issue of going into the winter. Some of the diesel prices sure. have actually increased quite dramatically. So how do they offset that at a time when that's going to be a bigger concern? Operation midterms. We've talked about it how many times over the last week. Operation midterms. Is this the final jobs report before the next midterms, before the midterms election, or do we get one more? Because no, I just is... wonder about I wonder about the timeline going into the midterms and whether this administration can get there, the Democrats can get there before we start to see the cracks in the labor market. I'm pretty sure that we have one more, but it comes after the Fed meeting, right? It comes sort at of the same time. In between. It's sandwiched in between. So some really interesting moments, and I wonder what that Fed meeting is going to be like. Canada's right? fascinating over the next month. It really is. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, is Nadia Lovell, Senior U.S. Equity Strategist at UBS Global Wealth Management. Nadia, wonderful to catch up with you this morning. Those decelerating rate hikes from 75 to 50 to 25 that everyone's hoping, praying for, if they're bullish, that is, is that sufficient to add to equities here? I think so, uh, but I, we do expect the market to remain volatile. You know, these rallies that we're seeing, we continue to expect them to fade. I mean, the Fed remains determined to bring down inflation, and they have been clear to us that they will not blink, nor even wink, and so even at the expense of growth. So it all depends on what the damage is to the economy at the end of the day, but we remain cautious in this environment, and we're more focused on the areas of the markets where we think that earnings are likely to be more durable in the face of any sort of economic slowdown, so areas like healthcare as well as consumer staples. And John, just quickly, November 4th is the next uh, visit payroll what, report what a right for. What a week is right. And it raises some issues about how quickly this market is moving. And Nadia, I would love for you to weigh in on that. I mean, do you have a sense that the circumstances are moving faster than the lagging indicators of a, a previous month's jobs report can really give us at a time of such change? Yes, you know, the Fed has been aggressive, and so it hasn't had time to really stop and see, like, what's happening in the economy. We are seeing signs of crack. We're seeing slowdowns. Well, so, and, you know, this earlier this week, we saw a decline in the number of job openings. We're seeing slowdown is in areas like semis. We're seeing more people announce hiring freezes. We're also seeing some cracks in the housing market. I mean, look at where the mortgage market is. And so by the time we get to the end of the year, though, we think that that's when the Fed is going to stop and pause and sort of look around and assess this situation. We are looking for a 75 basis points hike in the November meeting. But we admit that, you know, the fact is that dots were really close in the last um, September dots between 125 basis points and 100 points by the end of the year. But we think that we get to two and a quarter, excuse me, four and a quarter to four and a half percent by the end of the year. And then after that, we think the federal will remain on hold to sort of assess the, the lag um, that monetary policy tends to have on the economy. Nadia, just moments ago, John was talking about some of the price action, really fascinating price action. It's not today. It's uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty dull in a lot of the asset classes, but not in oil, not in crude. And we have seen that this week, this real incredible rally on the heels of what happened with OPEC+. Plus. How has the recent uh, sort of machinations and political backdrop affected your view on the energy sector at a time when at one point people were saying it's overbid heading into a downturn? I would tell you, Lisa, we have been positive on energy for almost two years now. We remain positive. I mean, the rally in energy has resumed, and it's really one of the few sectors that's sort of in this uptrend and where we aren't really concerned about the uh, earnings outlook. I mean, we continue to believe that oil prices, Brent is going to move above $110, around $110 by year end, and remain that way above that level into 2023. And, you know, obviously the continued upward pressure on oil will come from like the end of the SPR. We also will see the seaborne ban on Russian oil later this year. And then also there's going to be this switch in dynamic happening, increased demand away from natural gas, given the upward pressures there and, and substitution for for oil. So profits remains very healthy in this sector. And so we continue to remain very positive on the energy sector and see opportunities and there. Nadia, are we redefining how we play defense in a downturn? 
Yes. I mean, it's sort of like traditionally you would you would lean into all of the defensive sector. We have two of those defensive sector, as I noted, healthcare and consumer staples. But energy usually has been a more cyclical sector. But we think that there's opportunities there because we're less concerned about the demand picture on that, even in a downturn because the supply market remains so tight. So you sort of have to have a balance in this in this sort of new environment. It can't all, all be traditional defensive sectors. What about the banks? How do they fit into that theme? You know, the banks, we've been neutral on financials, just given the macro uncertainty and market volatility in capital markets. But you know, as we head into the earnings season, banks can solve that next year. The banks might actually have a decent setup. They should be able to benefit from, you know, net interest income side, given just the fact that we've had this increase in interest rates and also pick up in loan growth, uh, particularly on the commercial and industrial and consumer side. But that might be able to offset some of the pressures on the fee side. But like I said, we've been neutral on banks. The so wild card for banks remain provisions for loan loss, and there might be some need for them to build up reserve depending on each individual bank's views on the economic slowdown and the potential to um, dip into recession. So near term, you know, banks are okay set up, but as we head into 2023, um, there's some uncertainty. Nadia, thank you. As always, Nadia Lovell there of UBS Global Wealth Management going into the jobs report 20 minutes away, redefining defense in the equity market, talking about energy going into a recession, crude briefly on WTI, $90 a barrel. Other people agree with her, and you're starting to no, see that. And when we talked about earnings, people back out energy companies because they're leading the charge. I want to pick up on our point about banks sure. and building some reserves. There was a report out just theoretically, about banks that may have committed... A, a theoretical report. <laughs> that may have committed to financing Elon Musk's bid for Twitter and how much they would stand to lose. And some estimates have it be $500 million based on where they price things out in April and where things are certainly uh, currently trading if they sell all of the debt that they promised to finance. When's JP Morgan? Next Friday. Mm. Look forward to that. Morgan Stanley, too. How, do, how right, are they going to cloak bank. that? I, I don't think you can. I think we've got to discuss it, haven't we? We'll do that next week. Sharon Bella Goldman was on with me yesterday and was talking about perhaps the defence you could play, or rather a couple of days ago, the defence you could play in the European banks. They'd be more defensive than perhaps some people think. Did you see the story from the ECB this morning? The European Central Bank ratcheting up pressure on some banks to keep 22 bonuses in check amid fears about the darkening economic outlook. That's the ECB and what they think of banks going into a downturn. Well, Credit Suisse is buying back some bonds, so maybe they're trying to fortify their balance sheet ahead of, you know, whatever's going to happen. Fascinating stuff. 18 minutes away from payrolls, Randy Krosner is going to join us, the economics professor at the University of Chicago and the former Fed governor. We'll do that shortly from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Coming up in just a few minutes, we'll get a look at the monthly U.S. jobs report. Now, it's forecast to show that employers added 255,000 jobs in September, and that would be the smallest number since the decline in late 2020. Now, still, it would be an indication that the labor market remains strong, and that could have an impact on what the Fed does next. The Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded to human rights activists from Ukraine, Russia and Belarus. They were cited for documenting war crimes, human rights abuses and abuse of power. At the same time, the chair of the Nobel Committee criticized Vladimir Putin and the government of Belarus for suppressing activists. President Biden has taken his first major steps toward decriminalizing marijuana. The president pardoned thousands of Americans convicted of possession of the drug. Now, he also ordered a review of its legal status. Meanwhile, the president's actions have given marijuana stocks in the U.S. a jolt. They're rising in pre-market. Tesla's all-electric truck will roll out before the end of the year. In a tweet, Elon Musk said production had begun and the first deliveries will head to PepsiCo December 1st. The big rig was first unveiled in November 2017, but the launch was delayed a number of times due to a lack of battery cell availability and a decision to focus on its consumer models. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. With inflation running well above our 2% goal, 
Restoring price stability likely will require ongoing rate hikes and then keeping policy restrictive for some time until we are confident that inflation is firmly on the path toward our 2% goal. Lisa Cook, the Federal Reserve Governor at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Her first address as Fed Governor. Very cool. Congratulations to her. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. Counting you down to payrolls. The number, the data, 12 minutes away. Equity shaping up as follows. Not doing much at all in the equity market. We're up about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Yields are higher by almost the basis point at 383. Euro dollar going absolutely nowhere at 97.92. Unchanged, 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 Lisa, going into this one. Except for one figure. Crude. Yes. And we're seeing that increase pretty substantially, up 1.6%, following a week of gains that really has been extraordinary, especially given the downturn that people are talking about, not only now, but over the next six months with what the Fed is going to do. We're going to get things set for you. Mike McKee's going to enter the building any moment now. He's going to sit around this table. Randy Crozen's going to help us break down this number, too. He joined just the economics professor at the University of Chicago and former Fed governor. Randy, great to catch up with you, sir. The number about 11, 12 minutes away. Walk us through what you'll look for, first of all. The key thing is we want to see if the labor market is beginning to weaken. I mean, um, as uh, since I'm from University of Chicago, I'll uh, invoke um, uh, Milton Friedman's famous phrase from 60 years ago that monetary policy has uh, impacts with long and variable lags. And that's just as true today as it was then, that uh, it, uh, monetary policy we typically think of as having an impact in six to uh, 18 months. And it's about six months now since the Fed started its tightening cycle. So I think we're going to start to see uh, some uh, weakening in the labor market. Randy, given the fact that you were once a Fed governor not so long ago, can you translate for us what we can understand from Chris Waller's discussion of basically point by point taking apart all of the bullish equity strategists out there, every uh, argument that they have and saying, nope, we're not going to we're not going to stop our hiking because of that, not because of this, not because of financial stability, not because of uh, a slowdown in other non uh, employment figures. Yeah, what happened um, was that after the uh, the uh, late July meeting, I thought um, Jay Powell was very clear. I thought everyone was very clear about what they were going to do. But the markets just wouldn't accept it. So everyone started coming out and saying, we're going to do it. We're going to keep at it. And then Jay at the uh, at Jackson Hole ripped up his speech and said, I'm going to say one thing eight times, which is we're going to keep <laughs> at it. And, and I think what's now happened is the, the Fed has kind of um, uh, entrenched themselves and kind of like, no matter what happens, we're going to do it, which I think is the right, broadly the right message to be sending. But they should still be thinking with a little bit more nuance about, you know, what the data will say, et cetera, et cetera. But I think they've kind of gotten themselves, painted themselves into a corner, which probably is a good corner to be in because they really do have to um, execute on this. Um, but uh, I think they got there in a way because the market just wouldn't believe what they were saying earlier on. Okay, but you still have people who are kind of questioning it, Randy. I mean, you just heard Stephen Englander on this show basically saying it's like a parent saying, if you spend all of your allowance money, I'm not going to give you any money for lunch. And then they run out of their allowance money. And you say, okay, just kidding. Well, I'll give you some, but don't ever do it again. And basically the market is saying that that's what the Fed is doing as well. I mean, are you saying the same thing, but it's important for them to stick with this message? Well, actually, I think they are. Uh, it's not only the message, but I think maybe they uh, they really are saying, OK, we're not actually going to be as nuanced about the data because you don't hear them saying well, we're going to be data dependent. You hear them saying we're going to keep at it until um, inflation is down. So that's a different way of approaching it. And so I think they are going to be pretty, um, uh, pretty brutal. Uh, going forward. I think they're going to get to uh, low fours relatively soon. And then I think they're going to stick there and they want to make people clear that they're going to stick there. Now, of course, you know, Mr. Putin could do some things that, uh, that, that upend everything. But I think they're pretty strongly committed to this. Randy, they're not going to keep hiking until they get down to 2%. They've basically told us that. They've told us that they're waiting to see a convincing string of evidence that we're heading in that direction. Where do you think inflation needs to be on headline? to come to that conclusion? Well, I think it's not just exactly where it needs to be on headlines. So they, they prefer, they focus on the uh, personal cons consumption expenditure index, the PCE, rather than the CPI. You know, that's running at a much lower level than the uh, the CPI is, since that's more in sort of the, uh, the, the five to uh, uh, five, six uh, or, or so range. It needs to be coming down. So they need to, to one, see the direction 
And then two, see that um, uh, I would say probably they, they wouldn't start moving down until certainly it's under four and perhaps even under three. Well, we're at eight right now. So that's a problem. Randy, you're going to stick with well, us. No, that's CPI. Sure. What's that? Sorry, Randy? So, uh, that's CPI. So PCE is lower. Yeah, no. So are you saying we'd have to be at four PCE or four CPI? Because I was talking about headline right now is at eight. Oh, no. I, I, well, they focus on PCE. No, I that's, get that. That's their No, I understand engage. that. Okay. Uh, CPI, I mean, the relationship between CPI and PCE, sometimes they're closely related, sometimes they're not so closely related. CPI is going to be above, above that. I'm not quite sure, but they're not focused on CPI, so I don't really have a, a view on that. Well, they change, they change their mind every month on that, Randy, as you well know. <laughs> One minute, it's headline, no, that, 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 it's cool. Cool. It's you, Mitch. Well, I think that's a little unfair. I think they're, they've been focusing on PC for a while. They do talk about all of the other pieces because, of course, that affects people's cost of living, and uh, so it has, has an important impact. But I think for their, their prime decision-making, it's going to be PCE and headline, but primarily core because core really tells you – gives you more information about where things are going because it's always best to make policy in the front view mirror rather than the rear view mirror. Randy Crowson, are you going to stick with us going into payrolls, which is about six minutes away, way more diplomatic than either of us, Randy Depp, <laughs> yes. on the Federal Reserve. Which is the reason why he was on the Federal Reserve Governor Board. Of course. And neither of us are uh, not the only reason. But my, my point, I, I think, <laughs> is that you know he, he is, though, making an interesting point, which is originally it was about sentiment, which is the reason why we cared about the University of Michigan Sentiment Survey so much, and the idea of inflation expectations becoming unmoored. As inflation goes down, do they sorry to use this word pivot, I like felt myself kind of hesitating back to the word. PCE, the core PCE uh, kind of metric to determine when to really take the pedal off the brake. I'd like to give Mike McKee the final word going into payrolls. The print about five minutes away. Mike's going to break it down. Mike, your number one thing you're looking for? Uh, job growth, uh, because the Fed is looking for sort of a sequential slowdown. Uh, we could look at uh, the unemployment rate and the participation rate, but the Fed's kind of gotten to the point where they don't think the participation rate's going to go up a whole lot more. So let's look at the, the headline number. But one thing Mary Daly said the other day. What did she say? We are data dependent, and data is a plural word. So they're not just looking at PCE, they're looking at Every other inflation measure, and Mitch. they're looking at the labor measures, and you miss. They want a, a, a to, what was the word? Totality? The totality of the data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Mike, looking forward to you breaking down the numbers. Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock is going to be with us too. Randy Crows in the back with us as well to break down that number in about four and a half minutes' time. Going into it, here's how the stage is set for you. The equity market doing not much at all all morning on stocks, on bonds, in foreign exchange as well. We're looking for 255,000, the previous number, 315. Unemployment, the median estimate, 3.7%, in line with the previous month as well. Wages in focus and a participation rate as well. Futures up by about a tenth of 1%. The jobs number up next. Ten seconds away from the payrolls report in the United States of America. Mike McKee around the table ready to break that down for you. Futures totally unchanged on the S&P 500. A little bit firmer now, up three or four tenths of one percent. With the number, here's Mike McKee. Well, we come in almost bang on, John. If uh, you're looking for 263,000, you've won. <laughs> and the Fed might be looking for a number about that level. That's the change in non-farm payrolls from the month before. Private payrolls up by 288,000. The forecast was for 255 on the headline, 275 on private. So we come in very close to what the consensus was. The unemployment rate drops to three and a half percent. Uh, guess there is that uh, we had fewer people who were looking for work. We'll take a look at that in just a second. Average hourly earnings up three tenths on the month, and that pushes the year over year number down to five percent, which was uh, what was expected. The labor force participation rate drops a tick to 62.3, so that's probably why we're seeing the unemployment rate do what it did. The uh, change in private payrolls last month was revised down from 308 to 275. Uh, so it looks like uh, we're getting some little bit weaker numbers. This is the kind of 
drop, a sequential fall that the Fed would be looking for to suggest that their medicine is kind of working, starting to at least. I've got caught out too many times coming up with nice little neat narratives around the Tay Rolls report and the market action, Mike, and then I've got whipsawed by the price action several hours later. But I can give you the knee-jerk reaction right now. Futures down by three quarters of 1% on the S&P, positive by about a third of 1% going into the print. Coming out of it, we are negative. Yields are higher at the front end by seven or eight basis points on a two-year to four thirty-three on a 10-year up by five basis points to three eighty-seven. Mike, I wonder if we're picking up on the upside surprise on the, the payrolls report, just initially anyway, and that downside surprise in unemployment and participation coming down too. Put it all together for us. The, the downside surprise in unemployment, in my mind, is what's doing it because the number, the, the ex, ex, number in exceeding the uh, forecast isn't that great. It's uh, 13,000 higher. Uh, we saw 11,000 higher uh, for July revised up, but August isn't changed at 315. So labor market strength is about what it was, getting a little bit weaker. But then it becomes a question of who's getting the jobs and how many people are in and out of work. And I'm just looking here um, at the uh, employment and unemployment numbers. The uh, labor force uh, falls by 57,000. Remember, it rose by 768,000 the month before. So that's going to account for why we're seeing the unemployment rate drop. The number of employed uh, rises by uh, 80,000 and the number of unemployed, uh, number of employed uh, rises by 204,000. The number of unemployed falls by 251. In some ways, on the margins, not an extraordinary move one way or another, but on the margins, this is exactly what the Fed does not want to see. Because what you're seeing is a shift away from the perfect landing of seeing more people coming into the labor force and creating a bit more slack to uh, potentially loosen some of the price pressures that you're seeing. How would you interpret this using the other data points, as Mary Mary Daly pointed, because it's a, a multitude of points, in terms of how much further they are away from their goal? Uh, it's hard to say that they're necessarily far away from their goal because we did see the jolts numbers come down and the number of job openings are falling. And uh, Mary Daly, the San Francisco Fed president, was in here the other day, and she was suggesting that the unemployment rate would trail other indicators because there are a lot of jobs available, even if they have come down. And so the number of people who lose jobs would fall as people could take jobs that were out there. So it may not be as bad as it looks. There are some, Steve Stanley at Amherst Pierpont, who thinks we'll get to 3.4% by the end of the year because of that. We're going to see a, a tighter labor market in the unemployment side, the household side. Uh, but we are seeing a drop in wages and we're seeing a drop in the number of people who are getting jobs. So overall, a reasonable number for Should the Should we Fed. do the totality of the data, so to speak, I think you next have, week, CPI, yeah, you 75 have, you nailed on? that, yeah. Uh, well, 75 is the bar, and, and it's going to be a, a hard to bring that bar down uh, for the Fed. And this number would tell you that 75 is, you know, what you want to do because the labor market is still strong enough. I don't think CPI is going to fall enough that we get down to 50 and I think, you know, you're going to stay at 75 at this point because uh, that makes sense. We often describe payrolls, guesses, Lisa, as throwing a dart at a dartboard with a blindfold on. City won that game this week. I think they went with 265. We ended up with 263. So we congrats, Andrew Hollenhorst, to the team. Congrats to Andrew Hollenhorst, but really... Everyone deserves a congratulations. No, everyone it was gets so, a medal. Everyone, no, I'm not going to go there. But get a participation it, trophy. It was, here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The participation rate's going down. We got to get more people involved. But honestly, there there is this feeling that the range was really tight. People got this correct in terms of where we were in terms of the labor market, which is a surprise because it's been a so different. Left wing of you. Everyone gets a medal. Which is down a half of one percent. On the S&P. That's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Full of messages people, start. It's just a joke. The space for humor. Mike McKee, thank you. Randy Krosner joins us now. Economics professor at the University of Chicago Booth School, former Fed governor. Randy, we'd love your reaction to this. Futures down just a little, little bit. We're off four tenths of one percent. Your thoughts on this report? So I think exactly as you were describing, it's going to keep the Fed uh, on track for a 75 basis point move at the next meeting. Uh, it's broadly within the parameters of what they were expecting. Um, as, as you had said, that they were hoping that they'd still see a little bit more uh, uptick in labor force participation, but um, they didn't get that. Uh, 
they do, uh, I think they are expecting that the unemployment rate will start to move up a bit. Something that'll be heartening is that we didn't see an acceleration in wage growth. So, um, so that isn't, isn't taking off. That would be the most problematic thing for them because that would suggest inflation expectations or inflation really becoming quite entrenched. And so I think that's the, uh, the other key thing to be looking at going forward. Where is wage growth going? And so far that uh, at 5%, Obviously, that's uh, higher, much higher than it has been, uh, but certainly uh, lower than pretty much any measure of uh, headline inflation. Randy, I want to stick on participation rate for just a minute. We haven't gotten back to the pre-pandemic levels, and a lot of people were hoping for a soft landing, or you have more people come into the labor market who were sort of sitting out during the pandemic in the direct aftermath. How does this rejigger the expectations of the Federal Reserve, of this labor market, and how much it's been transformed post-pandemic? Well, I don't think this one report is really, really changing that, but I think they're gradually coming to realize that a lot of people are just not coming back in. For example, older workers, uh, labor force participation had been quite high before the, the pandemic, and now it's uh, significantly lower. Uh, people, uh, older workers found a lot of the people that they knew didn't make it through COVID. Um, they want to be able to spend time with their uh, uh, their families, and uh, and so I think those uh, they're much less likely to come back in. And that's a challenge for the labor market because those are the most skilled workers. And this is one of the challenges that we're seeing now, this skill mismatch that there are, you know, there are a lot of openings, but there aren't people who have the their right skills for those, uh, for those jobs. Randy, I, I just have to point out this tweet from Ivan the K. Uh, on Twitter, uh, reminder, be sure to fit today's labor market report into your narrative, even if you need to use a shoehorn. How does the narrative change, or what should the narrative be heading into year end as we look at the multitude, the totality of data, and try to understand where we are in this economic cycle? Well, I mean, we're fortunate that um, uh, we still have a very strong labor market, and so um, people have a lot of job opportunities, despite the Fed having moved interest rates up so much and so uh, so quickly. But as I had said uh, before, monetary policy has impact with long and variable lags. So typically, it starts having an impact in about six months or so, and we're getting to that point. So I do think that we're going to start to see the uh, the labor market weaken through the uh, the rest of the year. But the Fed's going to keep at it. Uh, there's nothing in this uh, this report that is going to suggest to them that they need to, to pull back. They're going to uh, continue full bore towards uh, four plus by the end of the year. And then somewhere in the mid fours or so, they'll uh, or or uh, closer to five, they will uh, they will stop. But that that will then depend on the data and how things are evolving next year, and also uh, the the uncertainties of what Mr. Putin might do. And hey, Randy, we appreciate your time today, sir. As always, looking forward to next month's conversation. Randy Krosner there of the University of Chicago. Futures down off the back of this by six or seven tenths of one percent. Yields up at the front end of the curve. That's the response to the number we got just. Moments ago, we're up six basis points on a two-year to 4.31, call it 4.32, on a 10-year yields up by 5 to 3.88. Coming up in the next hour, catching up with Rick Reeder of BlackRock, Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital Network, P. Jim's Mike Collins, then at 9.40, the reaction from the White House. Lisa, looking forward to catching up with Secretary Walsh in the next hour. Yep. Something for everyone in this jobs report, right? I, I just, I really enjoy that, that Twitter post where basically people are saying you can find anything you want, take your narrative, just use shoehorn, stick it in there. I mean, that's basically what's been happening. However, one thing that is quite clear, this labor market is still pretty resilient. You are seeing that resilience in the economy, which is the reason why some people are arguing that the soft landing scenario looks further and further away, simply because they're going to have to do more to stop this ship. If you ask people in America right now, what are they more concerned about, losing their job or high inflation? I wonder if the same answer that they would give you is the same answer you'd get from the Federal Reserve right now. I suspect it might be. And for that reason, this Fed has probably got more work to do, right? I think that that's basically what Mary Daly was saying. And that precisely was a lot what of, she told exactly Mike what McKee. she was yeah. saying. Um, and it comes at a time when people are seeing a punitive level of inflation. It's hurting the lower income brackets. I'm going to run, Lisa. Have a this great time. Fun. It was a great weekend. Fun. You too. Have a great Both one. Weekends post-pandemic start on a Thursday afternoon. You know this, right? And <laughs> I guess and on payrolls Friday, they started about 8.40. But stick around for Bloomberg Real Yield <laughs> a little bit later too. You can make it that far. <laughs> Not that you're bitter or anything. No, at all. Thank, thank you for, uh, for that. And honestly, I'm really looking forward to hear what Marty Walsh has had to say. Mike McKee, before we get on to our next guest, I'd love your take. You've been parsing through the data. What have you discovered in terms of some of the nuances underneath? Well, uh, we looked at what happened with the unemployment 
unemployment rate, but the interesting thing about employment is that we uh, did see a seasonal effect, it looks like, in education. Uh, state and local education uh, lost 20 1,000 jobs, which is going to be seasonal because in September everybody comes in. So they didn't hire quite as many people as they thought. The seasonals pushed that down. And so we probably would have had a little bit bigger number, but we did have a big gain in August. And maybe some of the school districts have moved their business to uh, to August, uh, moved the start of school year to August. So we're seeing some numbers come in there. And then uh, retail sales, uh, retailers uh, uh, gained only 1,000 jobs even though service producing jobs were up 264,000, most of it comes in temporary help and uh, business services. So uh, maybe companies are doing the opposite of what they do when the economy is getting better and they hire people temporarily till they know they really need them. Maybe now they're beginning to think, well, maybe we don't need as many people, but we still have business to do, so we'll use some temps. And the retailers have been in a tough spot. Levi Strauss actually just reporting uh, some negative earnings, those shares uh, plunging, which is a story we've seen. And how much do we start to see the negative earnings revisions on the heels of some of this weakness and expectation of that. Jeff Rosenberg uh, joins us now following the labor market report that we got pretty much bang on for the expectations. BlackRock portfolio manager of the Systemic Multi-Strategy Fund. Jeff, your take on this particular jobs report. Yeah, Lisa, I think you hit it on the head earlier in your reaction to the unemployment rate and the labor force participation rate. I think that's why you're seeing you know, a little bit of negative reaction in the front end of bond curves, a little bit of negative reaction in interest rate, sorry, in equity futures. You know, I think this is a, a slight disappointment relative to hopes that, you know, this report would, would give a piece of evidence in favor of the camp that there's a, a slowdown and a pivot underway. And, and I think that's going to be disappointed in this report. It's one report. It's probably not even the most important report. Next week, we'll get the most important report, which is the CPI report. But I think in total, uh, that's really the, the, the numbers that sort of stand out to me is the, the failure to see an increase in the participation rate. And that's really about the forward-looking view on wage pressures. So yes, the wage pressures didn't go up, but they're still exceedingly high. And while they stay high, that is the source of the other camp's view, which is a, that we're in a wage price spiral. So I think it's a little bit disappointing to the, to the dovish camp, a little bit reinforcing to the hawkish camp. Minor on both sides of the of the argument, but but definitely tilting that way. And that's why you're getting the market reaction you are today. So we get a lot of fund managers on the show, and they always say, we're not trading every day. We're not an algo. Uh, and they say, you know, we have a, a certain approach, and we kind of move along. How has your pro approach shifted as you get the multitude of data that we're getting? And how much are you looking to change it heading into your end? Well, it's a, it's a great question, Lisa. And the issue is is the degree of uncertainty here with regards to the inflation outlook. Um, and and it's it's very hard to forecast. So we have a little saying: if, if you if you don't have a good forecast, then observe. It's sort of what the Fed is saying in terms of being data dependent. They don't know what the trajectory of inflation is going to be, and so they're going to observe. So it's very hard to kind of trade every little. Uh, change and turn in the in the data we take a step back and we look at the overall trend and as i as i just highlighted this is you know one piece of information that's a little bit in the camp of the of the hawkish camp that the fed needs to do more uh, but no one really knows where uh, inflation is is going to go and and we have uh, expectations however in the bond market and the consensus view of a, a relatively benign amount of uh, impact to the economy for a dramatic increase, sorry, dramatic decrease in the amount of inflation. And I, and I think the, the, the weight of the proof of that being the correct view uh, is on that side of the argument. And, and, and so I think it's, it's highly uncertain. And today is a little bit on the hawkish side. You can't trade every little uh, data point you say, but Yesterday, we saw jobless claims up just a little bit, still very, very low, and uh, markets turned around. When are they going to get the message that the Fed is sending and uh, just kind of sit back and let the economy go because the Fed isn't going to change its mind? Well, 
you, you know, the, uh, the Fed is sending mixed messages, right? If, if you look at the distribution of the out years, SEP median Fed funds expectations, they're, they're all over the map and they represent basically the it's time to slow and we want to avoid the over tightening camp to the we need to get inflation down and that's job number one. Uh, on top of that is a very strong history of central bank react central banks reacting to financial stability concerns. You know, right now with a strong labor market, this is the relatively easy part of the Fed's tightening cycle. And I think they're trying to get as much as they can under their belt while labor markets are strong. When you start to see significant financial stability concerns and when you start to see the slowdown that they're hoping for and anticipating in the economy and in the labor market, uh, the job is going to get that much difficult, more difficult, both for the Fed as well as for uh, us and, and financial market participants. Jeff, how comfortable are you right now with market pricing that we're going to get uh, rate cuts as soon as late next year? Well, that was really what I was kind of referring to, is that we've got the rate cuts priced into the market. We've got a, a slow but steady decline in inflation forecasts and consensus forecasts uh, back down to 2%, back down to the pre-COVID environment without a tremendous amount of tightening uh, required. And I think that that remains a challenged view as we see how the data develops. Today is a little bit uh, in favor of that view. We haven't seen the significant tightening yet. Yes, monetary policy operates with a lag. So we're waiting on those lags. But the real disappointment and the real issue for markets will come next week because we haven't seen the slowdown in core CPI. And, and that's the, the bigger concern. And it weighs into the argument that Summers and Jason Furman are making that the market is off, the Fed is off, with respect to their forecasts of how much tightening is required and that there's going to require a lot more tightening before we see the decline in inflation that is in market expectations. So I think those de declines in the second half of next year, um, you know, th that very much remains to be seen. We're a little bit cautious on adopting that view right now. Jeff Rosenberg, Portfolio Manager of the Systematic Multi-Strategy Fund at BlackRock. Thank you so much. And Mike, you know, I'm really struck by this, uh, this discussion of the fact that we're going to have to get to a much higher terminal rate in order to slow inflation. And all right, this labor market report pretty much uh, in line with what we were expecting doesn't matter anymore. Now it's CPI. It is CPI, and it's always been CPI. Uh inflation, put it that way, because the Fed does, as you were discussing earlier, uh, follow the, the PCE numbers. But CPI is the proxy, and CPI gives us the biggest breakdown of where inflation is. So next week's number is going to be very important, in a sense. The Fed has said 75, so unless inflation absolutely collapsed, they're going to do 75, won't change their mind there. But what they would like to see is some progress in bringing down some of these uh, prices. And we were speaking with Anna Wong of Bloomberg Intelligence earlier, and she was talking about how she could see a 5% Fed funds rate, that that's ultimately where they're going to get to. How divergent is that from the rest of Wall Street? It's not as well. From Wall Street, it's it's higher than Wall Street wants it to be, so it's higher than most of the forecasts. It's not that divergent from where the Fed is because most of them have marked up their numbers. They're between four and a half and five. So if inflation proves sticky, you'll see those numbers go a little bit higher, maybe over five. Given where we are now, they think that if you get to between four and five, four and a half and five, that's going to be enough to put the brakes on inflation in the economy. But uh, we won't know for some time. As we look right now, we're looking at a two-year yield of 4.32 percent, touching earlier the highest levels going back to 2007, just off some of the initial highs. But nonetheless, a knee-jerk reaction that this will give the Fed more rope to continue to hike rates aggressively into year-end and potentially beyond. Ira Jersey, chief U.S. interest rate strategy for Bloomberg Intelligence joining us right now. Ira, your take on this labor market report. Yeah, so I think I, I agree with some of the uh, the, the former uh, the, the former guests basically saying that you can find anything if you're hawkish or dovish in this report. I, I think generally speaking, it was uh, middle of the road enough that it will keep the Federal Reserve 
um, on the hiking trend. I agree with Mike McKee that uh, the Fed is, is likely to go 75 basis points in November. There's not, nothing in this report that should change that uh, that outlook. I think something that's interesting that we've seen um, you know, just in the market uh, post the, the initial knee-jerk reaction was that the, the yield curve has actually steepened a little bit. We were flatter going into the number. Uh, the twos, tens curve was a couple of basis points flatter. Now we're about a basis point steeper uh, on the day. And, and that might reflect just some of the forward uncertainty that that some of the incoming data certainly represents. And, and uh, when we look at the Fed funds futures um, about the terminal rate pricing, um, we are starting to price finally for uh, the Fed to stay at its terminal rate a little bit above four and a half percent for most of 2023 now. So we, you know, we're, before we were talking about early cuts, uh, now it's it, uh, the market's only pricing maybe one cut in 2023. So I think that that's a significant change since uh, over the last couple of weeks since the last Fed meeting. Ira, I'd love your take on what Jeff Rosenberg was just talking about, uh, that perhaps some of this data is really highlighting the point that was put out by Larry Summers uh, and, and a number of others where uh, they, they're talking about the Fed funds rate needing to be much higher than people previously expected because of the stickiness of inflation. And perhaps we'll get that with CPI. Certainly with the labor market, it is holding in much more than people thought. Are you sympathetic to that view that the terminal rate is something closer to that 5% level of your colleague, Anna Wong? Yeah, so we, we've been above uh, at four and a half percent or or a little bit higher than that since May. So, you know, we're, we're now pricing for for our forecast. I, I think the Federal Reserve can hike to around, you know, somewhere in that four and a half to five percent range, call it four and three quarters uh, on the upper band, uh, which is exactly what the market's pricing right now. But by the way, and then hold it there for a while. Right. Because because the, the Fed at some point is going to say, look, the long and variable legs uh, point of view, where um, once we get to that level, we can hold it there for a long time. Now, from, from a market dynamic standpoint, if that's what happens and the market starts to expect the Fed to be on hold for, say, the better part of a year, year and a half uh, at, at, say, four and three quarters on the upper band, that means something like two-year notes can probably um, can probably sell off a little bit more, but not much, uh, given, given where they're currently priced. The question then is, what does the long end do? Does the 10-year and the 30-year, do they expect a reacceleration of inflation? inflation and the Federal Reserve to have to hike more, in which case you probably get a, a steeper curve or less inverted curve than you have right now. Uh, but if the market is thinking that, hey, we're going to go into a recession, which I think is still more or less the consensus, that um, then you can wind up with even a flatter yield curve and you can see 10-year yields rally a lot more and, and see maybe three and a quarter percent 10-year yields next year, where you still have this relatively uh, high two-year note yield. So so, so I think it's, it's really the curve dynamics that are going to be interesting interesting. And, and I think some of those, some sectors like the financial sectors, uh, for example, like, like, uh, like banks, that can seriously affect some of the uh, earnings uh, potential outlook in, in some of those sectors. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much for your insights. As always, Mike, what do you make of this whole discussion of a fully employed recession, of something where we don't necessarily see the labor market participate in uh, something of a downturn that, as Ira was saying, is sort of turning into a base case? Well, employment is lagging, first of all. So from history, you know that it's going to take a while to come down. This has also been a very unusual uh, economic recession and recovery. A lot of uh, supply issues. Uh, we shut down the whole economy, reopened it, and a lot of people dropped out of the labor force. So it's kind of hard to get a, a good read on all of that. But I think the bottom line from all of this is that what's going to happen is going to take time. It's not going to be an immediate collapse in inflation. It's not going to be an immediate collapse in the economy. Uh, Atlanta Fed GDP now 2.7 percent. We'll see what it is after today uh, for the third quarter. So a big rebound in growth at a time when the Fed is raising interest rates. It's just going to take time for this to play out. And the people on the Wall Street trading desk are going to have to have more patience than perhaps they do. And perhaps it's going to be a little bit more immediate when it comes to corporate profits. And we've seen that from a number of companies. Gina Martin-Adams has been tracking it. And she joins us now, Chief Equity Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. Gina, in your uh, examination of some of the recent earnings reports and guidance that we've gotten out, how much and how quickly is the mood shifting in corporate executive C-suites rather than just looking at these sort of broad macroeconomic data points? Yeah, I think the mood has shifted quite quite materially, frankly, over the course of this year. We've seen companies migrate from 
their primary concern being inflation to their primary concern being a combination of the extreme currency volatility that has been recorded over the course of 2022 and a recessionary-like slowdown in growth conditions. We've definitely seen this start to show up in consensus estimates as well. Uh, as far back as June of this year, analysts were forecasting 10% growth in earnings for the third quarter earnings season, which we're about to go into. Uh, now analysts are anticipating 3%. Certainly, the market itself also has started to forecast an earnings recession emerging. Uh, our model would suggest that at our September lows, provided an assumption that the bond market had the outlook for rates correct, the market was pricing for a 15% correction in earnings over the course of the next 12 months. Even if you get more aggressive on the rates forecast, you suggest that ultimately that terminal rate does get to 5%. And reflecting that the two-year yield needs to get to 5% over the course of the next 12 months as well, our markets were already pricing a 5% correction in earnings. So the market is well ahead of what's likely to happen in the economy and has even forecast a pretty severe recession. Pretty severe recession. Is it in all sectors or is it specific to the retailers, specific to the semiconductors, specific to sectors that can remain insulated from, say, some of the broader names that make up the index? Well, if you look at consensus expectations as a proxy for what we are likely to expect for the third quarter, the analyst consensus thinks that six different sectors are likely to record an earnings recession or a drop in earnings relative to that of a year ago as of the third quarter. In the second quarter, it was three. So there is a clear spreading of weakness going on. Energy is absent <laughs> the weakness. Energy right. is still experiencing double-digit earnings growth gains, but that's likely to change going into 2023. So what we have seen is a progression of weakness and a broadening of weakness to more and more industries and sectors. The weakness is predominantly about margins still as opposed to revenues, but nonetheless, even the revenue forecast well, is deteriorating. But, Gina, I actually want to pick up on this and just uh, in, in the minute that we have left. How surprised have you been that they're willing to sacrifice margins and to not lay people off to cut costs in order to preserve workers through a cycle after just getting burned by not having enough people or being able to bring people back after the pandemic? Yeah, I think it's a very difficult cycle, frankly. So I, I think this has been a surprise, but also sort of a consequence of the duration of this cycle. We, we were just in recession in 2020. So we haven't had the opportunity to really develop sort of a full economic cycle and then see removal of some of the excesses that typically develop in an economic cycle drive recession. So this recession is a consequence of very different factors than the normal type of, of earnings recession. Uh, a lot of it is, frankly, very tough comps from a year ago, because remember in 2021, we were experiencing extraordinary earnings growth after the 2020 correction in earnings growth. So it is very complicated. It's a much different cycle than is the norm. And inflation is clearly also in a very different position. Much of what we're seeing on margins is simply reflecting input cost changes and input cost volatility, which is clearly quite different than companies have been contending with for a long time. You have to remember that over the last decade, we've had very, very suppressed inflation, very low inflation volatility, allowing for margin expansion to sort of persist. Yeah. This is a very different climate this time around. Gina Martin-Adams of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much, as always, for your insights. Right now, we are seeing uh, about 31 minutes uh, from the opening bell. We are seeing the market continue with its decline, with S&P futures lower by more than a percent. You can see across the board, yields up, uh, stocks down, pretty much the playbook that we have seen. Coming up on the open on Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg Radio, Marty Walsh, U.S. Secretary of Labor, to respond to this particular uh, report to a strong labor market in the face of inflation. This is Bloomberg.